Counter Rev Audio. May 2021. The Fourth Political Theory by Alexander Dugin. First English edition published in 2012 by Arctos Media Limited, London. Introduction to Be or Not to Be. In today's world, politics appears to be a thing of the past, at least as we used to know it. Liberalism persistently fought against those of its political enemies which had offered alternative systems, that is, conservatism, monarchism, traditionalism, fascism, socialism, and communism, and finally, by the end of the 20th century, had defeated them all. It would be logical to assume that politics would become liberal, while all of its marginalized opponents, surviving in the peripheral fringes of global society, would reconsider their strategies and formulate a new united front according to a land de Benoist's periphery against the center. Instead, at the beginning of the 21st century, everything followed a different script. Liberalism, which had always insisted on de-emphasizing the importance of politics, made the decision to abolish politics completely after its triumph. Maybe this was to prevent the rise of political alternatives and to ensure its eternal rule, or because its political agenda had simply expired with the absence of ideological rivals, the existence of which Carl Schmitt had considered indispensable for the proper construction of a political position. Regardless of the rationale, liberalism did everything possible to ensure the collapse of politics. At the same time, liberalism itself has changed, passing from the level of ideas, political programs and declarations to the level of reality, penetrating the very flesh of the social fabric, which became suffused with liberalism and, in turn, it began to seem like the natural order of things. This was presented not as a political process, but as a natural and organic one. As a consequence of such a historical transformation, all other political ideologies, passionately feuding against each other during the last century, lost their currency. Conservatism, fascism and communism, together with their many variations, lost the battle, and triumphant liberalism mutated into a lifestyle consumerism, individualism, and a postmodern manifestation of the fragmented and sub-political being. Politics became biopolitical, moving to the individual and sub-individual level. It turns out that it was not only the defeated political ideologies that left the stage, but politics itself, and even liberalism, in its ideological forms, exited. This is why it became nearly impossible to imagine an alternative form of politics. Those who do not agree with liberalism find themselves in a difficult situation the triumphant enemy has dissolved and disappeared, now they are left struggling against the air. How can one engage in politics if there is no politics? There is only one way out to reject the classical political theories, both winners and losers, strain our imaginations, seize the reality of a new world, correctly decipher the challenges of postmodernity and create something new something beyond the political battles of the 19th and 20th centuries. Such an approach is an invitation to the development of the fourth political theory beyond communism, fascism and liberalism. To move forward towards the development of a fourth political theory, it is necessary to reconsider the political history of recent centuries from new positions beyond the frameworks and clichés of the old ideologies, Realize and become aware of the profound structure of the global society emerging before our eyes. Correctly decipher the paradigm of postmodernity. Learn to oppose not the political idea, program or strategy, but the objective reality of the status quo, the most social aspect of the apolitical, fractured, post, society. And finally, construct an autonomous political model which offers a new way and a project for the world of deadlocks, blind alleys, and the endless recycling of the same old things, post-history, according to Baudrillard. Dot. This book is dedicated to this very problem as the beginning of the development of a fourth political theory, through an overview and re-examination of the first three political theories, and to the closely related ideologies of national Bolshevism and Eurasianism that came very close indeed to the fourth political theory. This is not dogma, nor a complete system, nor a finished project. 
This is an invitation to political creativity, a statement of intuitions and conjectures, an analysis of new conditions, and an attempt to reconsider the past. The fourth political theory is not the work of a single author, but is rather a trend comprising a wide spectrum of ideas, researches, analyses, prognoses, and projects. Anyone thinking in this vein can contribute his own ideas. As such, more and more intellectuals, philosophers, historians, scientists, scholars, and thinkers will respond to this call. It is significant that the book, Against Liberalism, by the renowned French intellectual Alain de Benoist, which has also been published in Russian by Amphora, has a subtitle, Towards the Fourth Political Theory. Undoubtedly, many things can be said on this theme by representatives of both the old left and the old right and, most likely, even by liberals themselves, who are conceptualizing qualitative changes to their own political platform, even while politics is disappearing. For my own country, Russia, the fourth political theory, among other things, has an immense practical significance. The majority of Russian people suffer their integration into global society as a loss of their own identity. The Russian population had almost entirely rejected the liberal ideology in the 1990s. But it is also apparent that a return to the illiberal political ideologies of the 20th century, such as communism or fascism, is unlikely, as these ideologies have already failed and proven themselves unequal to the challenge of opposing liberalism, to say nothing of the moral costs of totalitarianism. Therefore, in order to fill this political and ideological vacuum, Russia needs a new political idea. For Russia, liberalism does not fit, but communism and fascism are equally unacceptable. Consequently, we need a fourth political theory. And if, for some readers, this is a question of freedom of choice and the realization of a political will, which can always be viewed from a positive or negative position, then for Russia, it is a matter of life or death to be or not to be, in terms of Hamlet's eternal question. If Russia chooses to be, then it will automatically bring about the creation of a fourth political theory. Otherwise, for Russia there remains only the choice not to be which will mean to quietly leave the historical and world stage, dissolving into a global order which is not created or governed by us. A 1. The birth of the concept. The end of the 20th century the end of modernity. The 20th century has ended, but it is only now that we are truly beginning to realize and to understand this fact. The 20th century was the century of ideology. If, in the previous centuries, religion, dynasties, estates, classes, and nation-states played an enormous role in the lives of peoples and societies, then, in the 20th century, politics had shifted into a purely ideological realm, having redrawn the map of ethnicities, civilizations, and the world in a new way. On the one hand, political ideologies represented early and deeply rooted civilizational tendencies. On the other hand, they were completely innovative. All political ideologies, having reached the peak of their dominion and influence in the 20th century, were the product of the new, modern era, embodying its spirit, albeit in different ways and under different symbols. Today, we are rapidly leaving this era. Thus everyone speaks, more and more frequently, of the crisis of ideology, or even the end of ideology. For instance, the existence of a state ideology is explicitly denied in the Constitution of the Russian Federation. It is time to address this issue more closely. The three main ideologies and their fate in the 20th century. The three main ideologies of the 20th century were 1. Liberalism, left and right. 2. Communism, including both Marxism and socialism, along with social democracy. 3. Fascism, including National Socialism and other varieties of the Third Way Franco's National Syndicalism, Perón's Justicialism, Salazar's Regime, etc. They fought among themselves to the death, creating, in essence, the entire dramatic and bloody political history of the 20th century. It is logical to number these ideologies, or political theories, based in part on their significance, as well as in the order of their occurrence, as was done above. The first political theory is liberalism. 
it arose first as early as the 18th century and turned out to be the most stable and successful ideology, having ultimately prevailed over all its rivals. As a result of this victory, it proved, among other factors, the justification of its claim to the entire legacy of the Enlightenment. Today, it is obvious that it was liberalism that was the best fit for modernity. However, this legacy was disputed earlier, dramatically, actively, and, at times, convincingly, by another political theory communism. It is reasonable to call communism, much like socialism in all its varieties, the second political theory. It appeared later than liberalism as a critical response to the emergence of the bourgeois capitalist system, which was the ideological expression of liberalism. And finally, fascism is the third political theory. As a contender for its own understanding of modernity's spirit, many researchers, particularly Hannah Arendt, in particular, reasonably consider totalitarianism one of the political forms of modernity. Fascism, however, turned toward the ideas and symbols of traditional society. In some cases, this gave rise to eclecticism, in others to the desire of conservatives to lead their own revolution instead of resisting another's and leading their society in the opposite direction, such as Arthur Moeller van den Bruck, Dmitry Marizkovsky, and so on. Fascism emerged later than the other major political theories and vanished before them. The alliance of the first political theory with the second political theory, as well as Hitler's suicidal geopolitical miscalculations, caused it to expire prematurely. The third political theory was a victim of homicide, or perhaps suicide, not living long enough to see old age and natural decay, in contrast to the ideology of the Soviet Union. Therefore, this bloody vampiric ghost tinged with an aura of absolute evil is attractive to the decadent tastes of postmodernity, and is still used as a bogeyman to frighten humanity. With its disappearance, fascism cleared the field for the battle between the first and second political theories. This battle took the form of the Cold War and gave birth to the strategic geometry of the bipolar world which lasted for nearly half a century. By 1991, the first political theory, liberalism, had defeated the second political theory, socialism. This marked the global decline of communism. As a result, by the end of the 20th century, liberal theory is the only one remaining of the three political theories of modernity that is capable of mobilizing the vast masses throughout the entire world. Yet, now that it is left on its own, everyone speaks in unison about the end of ideology. Why? The end of liberalism and the arrival of post-liberalism. It turns out that the triumph of liberalism, the first political theory, coincided with its end. This only seems to be a paradox. Liberalism had been an ideology from the start. It was not as dogmatic as Marxism but was no less philosophical, graceful, and refined. It ideologically opposed Marxism and fascism, not only undertaking a technological war for survival, but also defending its right to monopolize its own image of the future. While the other competing ideologies were in existence, liberalism continued and grew stronger precisely as an ideology, in other words as a set of ideas, viewpoints, and projects that are typical for a historical subject. Each of the three political theories had its own subject. The subject of communism was class. Fascism's subject was the state, in Italian fascism under Mussolini, or race in Hitler's National Socialism. In liberalism, the subject was represented by the individual, freed from all forms of collective identity and any membership, elapartments. While the ideological struggle had formal opponents, entire nations and societies, at least theoretically, were able to select their subject of choice that of class, racism or statism, or individualism. The victory of liberalism resolved this question, the individual became the normative subject within the framework of all mankind. This is when the phenomenon of globalization entered the stage, the model of a post-industrial society makes itself known and the postmodern era begins. From now on, the individual subject is no longer the result of choice, but is a kind of mandatory given. 
Man is freed from his membership in a community and from any collective identity, and the ideology of human rights becomes widely accepted, at least in theory, and is practically compulsory. Humanity under liberalism, comprised entirely of individuals, is naturally drawn toward universality and seeks to become global and unified. Thus, the projects of world government or globalism are born. A new level of technological development makes it possible to achieve independence from the class structuralization of industrial societies, in other words, post-industrialism. The values of rationalism, scientism, and positivism are recognized as veiled forms of repressive, totalitarian policies, or the grand narrative, and are criticized. At the same time, this is accompanied by the glorification of total freedom and the independence of the individual from any kind of limits, including reason, morality, identity, social, ethnic, or even gender, discipline, and so on. This is the condition of postmodernity. At this stage, liberalism ceases to be the first political theory and becomes the only post-political practice. Fukuyama's end of history arrives, economics in the form of the global capitalist market, replaces politics, and states and nations are dissolved in the melting pot of world globalization. Having triumphed, liberalism disappears and turns into a different entity into post-liberalism. It no longer has political dimensions, nor does it represent free choice, but instead becomes a kind of historically deterministic destiny. This is the source of the thesis about post-industrial society, economics as destiny. Thus, the beginning of the 21st century coincides with the end of ideology that is, all three of them. Each met a different end, the third political theory was destroyed in its youth, the second died of decrepit old age, and the first was reborn as something else as post-liberalism and the global market society. In any case, the form which all three political theories took in the 20th century is no longer useful, effective, or relevant. They lack the ability to explain contemporary reality or to help us understand current events, and are incapable of responding to the new global challenges. The need for the fourth political theory stems from this assessment. The fourth political theory is resistance to the status quo. The fourth political theory will not simply be handed to us without any effort. It may or may not emerge. The prerequisite for its appearance is dissent. That is, dissent against post-liberalism as a universal practice, against globalization, against postmodernity, against the end of history, against the status quo, and against the inertia of the processes of civilization at the dawn of the 21st century. The status quo and this inertia do not presuppose any political theories whatsoever. A global world can only be ruled by the laws of economics and the universal morality of human rights. All political decisions are replaced by technical ones. Machinery and technology substitute for all else. The French philosopher Alain de Benoist terms this law governance or micromanagement. Managers and technocrats take the place of the politician who makes historical decisions, optimizing the logistics of management. Masses of people are equated to a mass of identical objects. For this reason, post-liberal reality or, rather, virtuality increasingly displacing reality from itself, leads straight to the complete abolition of politics. Some may argue that the liberals lie to us when they speak of the end of ideology, this was my debate with the philosopher Alexander Zinoviev. In reality, they remain believers in their ideology and simply deny all others the right to exist. This is not exactly true. When liberalism transforms from being an ideological arrangement to the only content of our extant social and technological existence, then it is no longer an ideology, but an existential fact, an objective order of things. It also causes any attempt to challenge its supremacy as being not only difficult, but also foolish. In the postmodern era, liberalism moves from the sphere of the subject to the sphere of the object. Potentially, this will lead to the complete replacement of reality by virtuality. The fourth political theory is conceived as an alternative to post-liberalism, but not as one ideological arrangement in relation to another. 
Instead, it is as an incorporeal idea opposed to corporeal matter, as a possibility entering into conflict with the actuality, as that which is yet to come into being attacking that which is already in existence. At the same time, the fourth political theory cannot be the continuation of either the second political theory or the third. The end of fascism, much like the end of communism, was not just an accidental misunderstanding, but the expression of a rather lucid historical logic. They challenged the spirit of modernity, fascism did so almost openly, communism more covertly, see the review of the Soviet period as a special, eschatological version of the traditional society by Mikhail S. Agursky or Sergei Karamurza and Lostot. This means that the struggle with the postmodern metamorphosis of liberalism into the form of postmodernity and globalization should be qualitatively different, it must be based on new principles and propose new strategies. Nevertheless, the starting point of this ideology is precisely the rejection of the very essence of postmodernity. This starting point is possible but neither guaranteed, nor ordained by fate because it arises from man's free will and his spirit rather than an impersonal historical process. However, this essence, much like the rationale behind modernity itself imperceptible earlier, but later realizing its essence so fully that it exhausted its internal resources and switched to the mode of ironically recycling its earlier stages, is something completely new, previously unknown, and only surmised intuitively and fragmentarily during the earlier stages of ideological history and the ideological struggle. The fourth political theory is a crusade against postmodernity, the post industrial society, liberal thought realized in practice, and globalization as well as its, its logistical and technological bases. If the third political theory criticized capitalism from the right and the second from the left, then the new stage no longer features this political topography it is impossible to determine where the right and the left are located in relation to post-liberalism. There are only two positions, compliance, the center, and dissent, the periphery. Both positions are global. The fourth political theory is the amalgamation of a common project and arises from a common impulse to everything that was discarded, toppled, and humiliated during the course of constructing the society of the spectacle, constructing postmodernity. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The philosopher Alexander Sakatsky rightly pointed out the significance of marginalia in the formation of a new philosophical age, suggesting the term metaphysics of debris as a metaphor. The battle for postmodernity. The fourth political theory deals with the new reincarnation of an old enemy. It challenges liberalism, much like the second and third political theories of the past but it does so under new conditions. The principal novelty of these conditions lies in the fact that of all the three great political ideologies, only liberalism secured the right to the legacy behind the spirit of modernity and obtained the right to create the end of history based on its own premises. Theoretically, the end of history could have been different, a planetary Reich, if the Nazis had won, or global communism, had the communists been right. However, the end of history has turned out to be precisely liberal. The philosopher Alexander Kojiv was one of the first to predict this, his ideas were later restated by Francis Fukuyama. But since this is the case, then any appeals to modernity and its assumptions, to which the representatives of the second, to a greater extent, and third political theories appealed in varying degrees, lose their relevance. They lost the battle for modernity as the liberals triumphed. For this reason, the issue of modernity and, incidentally, of modernization, may be removed from the agenda. Now the battle for postmodernity begins. It is here that new prospects open up for the fourth political theory. The kind of postmodernity which is currently being realized in practice, postliberal postmodernity, cancels out the strict logic of modernity itself after the goal had been achieved, the steps taken to reach it lose their meaning. The pressure of the ideological shell becomes less rigid. The dictatorship of ideas is replaced by the dictatorship of things, login passwords and barcodes. New holes are appearing in the fabric of postmodern reality. 
As the third and second political theories, conceived as an eschatological version of traditionalism, once tried to saddle modernity in their struggle with liberalism, the first political theory, today there is a chance of accomplishing something analogous with postmodernity, using these new holes, in particular. Liberalism developed flawless weapons aimed at achieving its straightforward alternatives, which was the basis for its victory. But it is this very victory that holds the greatest risk to liberalism. We need only to ascertain the location of these new, vulnerable spots in the global system and decipher its login passwords in order to hack into its system. At the very least, we must try to do so. The events of September 11, 2001 in New York demonstrated that this is technologically possible. The Internet society can be useful, even for those who staunchly oppose it. In any case, first and foremost, we must understand postmodernity and our new situation no less profoundly than Marx understood the structure of industrial capitalism. The fourth political theory must draw its dark inspiration from postmodernity, from the liquidation of the program of the Enlightenment and the arrival of the Society of the Simulacra, interpreting this as an incentive for battle rather than as a destiny. Rethinking the past and those who lost. The second and third political theories are unacceptable as starting points for resisting liberalism, particularly because of the way in which they understood themselves, what they appealed to, and how they operated. They positioned themselves as contenders for the expression of the soul of modernity and failed in that endeavor. Yet nothing stops us from rethinking the very fact of their failure as something positive and recasting their vices as virtues. Since the logic of the history of the new era brought us to postmodernity, then it also contained the secret essence of the new era, which was only revealed to us in the end. The second and third political theories recognized themselves as contenders for the expression of modernity's spirit. And these claims came crashing down. Everything related to these unfulfilled intentions in the previous ideologies is uninteresting for the creators of the fourth political theory. However, we should attribute the very fact that they lost to one of their advantages rather than their disadvantages. By losing, they proved that they did not belong to the spirit of modernity, which in turn, led to the post-liberal matrix. Herein lie their advantages. Moreover, this means that the representatives of the second and third political theories, either consciously or unconsciously, stood on the side of tradition, although without drawing the necessary conclusions from this, or even not recognizing it at all. The second and third political theories must be reconsidered, selecting in them that which must be discarded and that which has value in itself. As complete ideologies trying to manifest themselves in a literal sense, they are entirely useless, either theoretically or practically. However, certain marginal elements which advocated ideas that were generally not implemented and which remained on the periphery or in the shadows, let us recall the metaphysics of debris once again, may, unexpectedly, turn out to be extremely valuable and saturated with meaning and intuition. Yet in any case, it is necessary to rethink the second and third political theories in a new way, and only after we reject our trust in those ideological structures on which their orthodoxy rested. Their orthodoxy is their most uninteresting and worthless aspect. Cross-reading them would be far more productive, Marx through a positive view of the right or Evola through a positive view of the left. This fascinating national Bolshevik undertaking, in the spirit of Nikolai V, Ustrilov or Ernst Nikisch, is not sufficient by itself. After all, a mechanical addition of the second political theory to the third will not, by itself, lead us anywhere. Only in retrospect can we delineate their commonalities, which were staunchly opposed to liberalism. This methodological exercise is useful as a warm-up before commencing a full-fledged elaboration of the fourth political theory. A truly significant and decisive reading of the second and third political theories is only possible on the basis of an already established fourth political theory. Postmodernity and its conditions, the globalist world, governance or micromanagement, the market society, the universalism of human rights, the real domination of capital, and so on, represent the main object of the fourth political theory. 
However, they are radically negated as values in themselves. The Return of Tradition and Theology Tradition, religion, hierarchy, and family, and its values were overthrown at the dawn of modernity. Actually, all three political theories were conceived as artificial ideological constructions by people who comprehended, in various ways, the death of God, Friedrich Nietzsche, the disenchantment of the world, Max Weber, and the end of the sacred. This was the core of the new era of modernity, man came to replace God, philosophy and science replaced religion and the rational, forceful and technological constructs took the place of revelation. However, if modernism is exhausted in postmodernity, then at the same time, the period of direct theomachy comes to an end along with it. Postmodern people are not inimical towards religion, but rather indifferent. Moreover, certain aspects of religion, as a rule, such as Satanism, and the demonic texture of postmodernist philosophers are quite appealing to many postmodern individuals. In any case, the era of persecuting tradition is over, although, following the logic of post-liberalism, this will likely lead to the creation of a new global pseudo-religion based on scraps of disparate syncretic cults, rampant chaotic ecumenism, and tolerance. While this turn of events is, in some ways, even more terrifying than direct and uncomplicated dogmatic atheism and materialism, the decrease in the persecution of faith may offer an opportunity, if the representatives of the fourth political theory act consistently and uncompromisingly in defending the ideals and the values of tradition. It is now safe to institute a political program that was once outlawed by modernity. It no longer appears as foolish and doomed for failure as before, because everything in postmodernity looks foolish and doomed for failure, including its most glamorous aspects. It is not by chance that the heroes of postmodernity are freaks and monsters, transvestites and degenerates this is the law of style. Against the backdrop of the world's clowns, nothing and no one could look too archaic, not even the people of tradition who ignore the imperatives of modern life. The fairness of this assertion is not only proven by the significant achievements of Islamic fundamentalism, but also by the growing influence of extremely archaic Protestant sects, dispensationalists, Mormons and so on, on American foreign policy. George W. Bush went to war in Iraq because, in his own words, God told me to invade Iraq. This is quite in keeping with his Protestant Methodist teachers, Thus, the fourth political theory may easily turn toward everything that preceded modernity in order to draw its inspiration. The acknowledgement of God's death ceases to be the mandatory imperative for those who want to stay relevant. The people of postmodernity are already so resigned to this event that they can no longer understand it who died exactly? But in the same way, the developers of the fourth political theory can forget about this event, we believe in God but ignore those who talk about his death, much like we ignore the words of madmen. This marks the return of theology and becomes an essential element of the fourth political theory. When it returns, postmodernity, globalization, postliberalism, and the post-industrial society is easily recognized as the kingdom of the Antichrist or its counterparts in other religions Dajjal for Muslims, Irev Rav for the Jews, and Kali Yuga for Hindus, and so forth. This is not simply a metaphor capable of mobilizing the masses, but a religious fact the fact of the apocalypse. Myths and Archaeism in the Fourth Political Theory If atheism, in the new era, ceases to be something mandatory for the fourth political theory, then the theology of monotheistic religions, which at one time displaced other sacred cultures, will not be the ultimate truth, either, or rather, may or may not be. Theoretically, Nothing limits the possibilities for an in-death readdressing of the ancient archaic values, which can take their place in the new ideological construction upon being adequately recognized and understood. Eliminating the need to adjust theology to the rationalism of modernity, the adherents of the fourth political theory are free to ignore those theological and dogmatic elements in monotheistic societies which were influenced by rationalism, especially in their later stages. The latter led to the appearance of deism upon the ruins of Christian European culture, followed by atheism and materialism, 
during the phased development of the program of the modern age. Not only the highest supramental symbols of faith can be taken on board once again as a new shield, but so can those irrational aspects of cults, rites, and legends that have perplexed theologians in earlier ages. If we reject the idea of progress that is inherent in modernity, which as we have seen, has ended, then all that is ancient gains value and credibility for us simply by virtue of the fact that it is ancient. Ancient means good, and the more ancient the better. Of all creations, paradise is the most ancient one. The carriers of the fourth political theory must strive toward rediscovering it in the near future. Heidegger and the event, Ariannes. Finally, we can identify the most profound ontological foundation for the fourth political theory. Here we should pay attention not only to theologies and mythologies, but also to the reflective philosophical experience of one particular thinker who had made a unique attempt of constructing a fundamental ontology the most all-encompassing, paradoxical, profound, and penetrating study of being. I am talking about Martin Heidegger. A brief description of Heidegger's concept is as follows. At the dawn of philosophical thought, people, more specifically, Europeans, and even more specifically, the Greeks, raised the question of being as the focal point of their thinking. But by making it their primary subject, they risk getting confused by the nuances of the complicated relationship between being and thought, between pure being, sane, and its expression in existence of being, say end, between the human experience of being in the world, daisy in being there, and being in itself, sane. This failure had already occurred in the teachings of Heraclitus about the Fusus and the Logos. Next, it is obvious that in Parmenides' work, and, finally, in Plato, who placed ideas between man and existence, and who defined truth as that which corresponded to them the referential theory of knowledge reached its culmination in failure. This gave birth to alienation, eventually leading to calculating thinking, das Rechnen den Ken, and then to the development of technology. Little by little, man lost sight of pure being and pursued the path of nihilism. The essence of technology, based on the relationship between technology and the world, expresses this ever-increasing nihilism. In the new era, this tendency reaches its pinnacle technical development, Gustel, ultimately displaces being and crowns nothingness. Heidegger bitterly hated liberalism, considering it an expression of the source of the calculative thinking which lies at the heart of Western nihilism. Postmodernity, which Heidegger did not live to see in its full manifestation, is, in every sense, the ultimate oblivion of being, it is that midnight, when nothingness, nihilism, begins to seep from all the cracks. Yet his philosophy was not hopelessly pessimistic. He believed that nothingness itself is the flip side of pure being, which in such a paradoxical way reminds mankind of its existence. If we correctly decipher the logic behind the unfurling of being, then thinking mankind can save itself with lightning speed at the very moment of its greatest risk. But where the danger lies, there also grows that which saves, Heidegger quotes from Friedrich Holderlin's poetry. Heidegger used a special term, Ariannes the event, to describe this sudden return of being. It takes place exactly at midnight of the world's night at the darkest moment in history. Heidegger himself constantly vacillated as to whether this point had been reached or not quite yet. The eternal not yet. Heidegger's philosophy may prove to be the central axis threading everything around itself ranging from the reconceived second and third political theories to the return of theology and mythology. Thus at the heart of the fourth political theory, as its magnetic center, lies the trajectory of the approaching Ariannes, the event which will embody the triumphant return of being, at the exact moment when mankind forgets about it, once and for all, to the point that the last traces of it disappear. The Fourth Political Theory in Russia Today, many people intuitively understand that Russia has no place in the brave new world of globalization, postmodernity, and postliberalism. First, the world state and the world government are gradually abolishing all nation-states in general. Even more important is the fact that the entirety of Russian history is a dialectical argument with the West and against Western culture, 
the struggle for upholding our own, often only intuitively grasped, Russian truth, our own messianic idea, and our own version of the end of history, no matter how it is expressed through Muscovite orthodoxy, Peter's secular empire, or the global communist revolution. The brightest Russian minds clearly saw that the West was moving towards the abyss. Now looking at where neoliberal economics and postmodern culture has led the world, we can be certain that this intuition, pushing generations of Russian people to search for alternatives, was completely justified. The current global economic crisis is just the beginning. The worst is yet to come. The inertia of post-liberal politics is such that a change of course is impossible, to save the West, unrestrained emancipated technology, Oswald Spengler will search for more efficient, but a purely technical, technological means. This is the new phase in the onset of Gustel, spreading the nihilistic stain of the global market over the entire planet. Moving from crisis to crisis and from one bubble to the next, the globalist economy and the structures of post-industrial society only make mankind's night blacker and blacker. It is so black, in fact, that we gradually forget that it is night time. What is light, people ask themselves, never having seen it. For example, at the time of the eruption of the 2008 financial crisis, thousands of Americans held a demonstration, asking for the government for yet another economic bubble. Could they be any more blunt? It is clear that Russia needs to follow a different path, its own. Yet herein lies the question and the paradox. Evading the logic of postmodernity in only one country will not be that simple. The Soviet model tried and collapsed. After that point, the ideological situation changed irreversibly, as did the strategic balance of power. In order for Russia to save herself and others, creating some sort of a technological miracle or a deceptive strategy is insufficient. World history has its own logic. And the end of ideology is not a random failure, but the beginning of a new stage and apparently the last one. In this situation, Russia's future completely relies on our efforts to develop the fourth political theory. We will not go far and will only delay the inevitable by attempting to sort those options that globalization offers to us on a local basis and by trying to correct the status quo in a superficial manner. Postmodernity's challenge is tremendously significant, it is rooted in the logic of being's oblivion and in mankind's departure from its existential, ontological, and spiritual, theological, roots. Responding to it with hat-tossing innovation or public relations surrogates is impossible. Therefore, we must refer to the philosophical foundations of history and make a metaphysical effort in order to solve the current problems the global economic crisis, countering the unipolar world, as well as the preservation and strengthening of sovereignty, and so on. It is difficult to say how the process of developing this theory will turn out. One thing is clear, it cannot be an individual effort or one that is restricted to a small group of people. The effort must be shared and collective. In this matter, the representatives of other cultures and peoples, both in Europe and Asia, can truly help us, since they sense the eschatological tension of the present moment just as acutely, and are looking for the way out of the global dead end just as desperately. However, it is possible to state in advance that the Russian version of the fourth political theory, based on the rejection of the status quo in its practical and theoretical dimensions, will focus on the Russian Ariannis. This will be that very event, unique and extraordinary, for which many generations of Russian people have lived and waited, from the birth of our nation to the coming arrival of the end of days. 2. Dacian as an actor. Stages and problems in the development of the fourth political theory. Being a supporter of cyclical development and an opponent of Francis Bacon and his theory of knowledge, I would still like to suggest that we develop and modify approaches to specific topics and areas of thought in an ongoing manner. We have repeatedly clarified the notion of conservatism. We conducted a series of conferences and scientific symposia on the fourth political theory. Let us believe that these efforts, the results of which have been published in magazines, anthologies, monographs, and websites, were not carried out in vain 
and that the reader is more or less familiar with them. Therefore, I propose to move on. I will demonstrate, with concrete examples, what has been done to promote the discussion of the fourth political theory and, consequently, the observable results of the activities conducted by the Center of Conservative Research at the Faculty of Sociology of Moscow State University and the St. Petersburg Conservative Club at the Faculty of Philosophy of St. Petersburg State University. This includes two books that were recently published in St. Petersburg by the wonderful St. Petersburg Publishing House Amphora, Alain de Benoist's Against Liberalism, Towards the Fourth Political Theory, and My Own the Fourth Political Theory. The book by the philosopher Alain de Benoist, who spoke at St. Petersburg State University during the philosophy days there, is a compendium of his views on philosophy and political science pertaining to the major issues of our time globalization, the economic and social crisis, the process of European integration, new political and social trends, the relationship between Europe and Russia, humanism, and so forth. All these problems are addressed from a critical standpoint toward the liberal ideology which dominates the world, the first, and the most stable, political theory. Lacking competition after the collapse of communism, it has become the primary target for criticism by those who are acutely aware of the negative impact of the status quo in politics, the social sphere, economics, culture, ideology, and so on, and who are searching for an alternative. The old alternatives to liberalism, communism, and fascism were overcome by history and discarded, each in its own way, and have demonstrated their ineffectiveness and incompetence. Therefore, the search for an alternative to liberalism must look somewhere else. The area to be searched is designated as the domain of the fourth political theory. Such an approach corresponds exactly to the stated theme, conservatism, the future or an alternative. If we think about an alternative and correlate it with the existing blueprint for the future, then we should clearly understand what that alternative is going to replace. The answer is simple, liberalism as the dominant global discourse. Therefore, the only significant alternative should logically be directed against liberalism, hence the title of Alain de Benoist's book. Nevertheless, the question remains, does conservatism fit this role? In part, we heard the answer in Benoist's speech, in which he criticized the liberal theory of progress. This philosophical approach proposes that conservatism is the most logical candidate for an alternative to liberalism, either as a relativizing worldview or as one which rejects progress altogether. What remains, then, is to specify the kind of conservatism in question. It is obvious that liberal conservatism cannot be considered an alternative to liberalism, being its variant. Thus, by the process of elimination, we can make a proposition we must look for an alternative to liberalism and non-liberal versions of conservatism. All this is logical, since Benoist himself is known as a philosopher with conservative views, he is sometimes referred to as one of the pioneers of the European New Right, but the particular kind of conservatism he has in mind is obvious from his newly published book. There is another aspect worth mentioning in regard to the title of Benoist's book. Many readers will remember another ideological manifesto directed against liberalism called After Liberalism by Emmanuel Wallerstein. Despite the similarity in their titles and the object of criticism, there is a significant difference. Wallerstein criticizes liberalism from the point of view of the left from the neo-Marxist position. And, like any Marxist, he sees liberalism, bourgeois democracy, and capitalism as a phase of historical development which is progressive in comparison with the preceding phases of development, such as feudalism or slavery, but is inferior to what must come after its socialism, communism, and so forth. We are talking about criticism from the left and, in some ways, from the standpoint of the future, which is expressed in Wallerstein's book title After Liberalism. This is a typical feature of Marxism. For Benoist, neither the superiority of liberalism over earlier types of societies, nor the advantages of a communist future, are obvious. Therefore, despite the similarity of titles, there is a fundamental difference between the author's initial positions. With Wallerstein, we are dealing with criticism from the left, with Benoist, with criticism from the right. 
Another difference involves the relationship to liberalism. According to Wallerstein, the end of liberalism is a foregone conclusion according to the very logic of socio-political and socio-economic history, and so he easily spoke of an after. For Benoist, the question remains, one must fight against liberalism, yet in this morally and historically justified struggle, there are no guaranteed results. It is important to fight against liberalism here and now, it is important to identify its vulnerabilities, it is important to forge an alternative worldview, but the future is in our hands, and it is open rather than predetermined. Wallerstein, in varying degrees, views things mechanically, like any Marxist, whereas Benoist is an organicist and holist, like any, real, conservative. The last item that I would like to point out in regard to the ideas of Alain de Benoist and their relevance is his understanding of Carl Schmitt's concept of the fourth nomos of the earth, that is, the relationship between political science and political theology with geopolitics and the new model of the political organization of space. For my part, in the book Fourth Political Theory, I reviewed the three primary political theories of the past liberalism, Marxism, socialism, and fascism, including national socialism, summed up their overall balance, and attempted to identify the horizons for the development of the fourth political theory beyond all three ideologies. This, of course, is extremely far from any dogmatism or proposal for a complete answer to the stated problem. Nevertheless, these are rather specific steps toward the preparation for tackling this issue. Without repeating what was said in my book and the book by Alain de Benoist, I will try to make a number of remarks about the development of this subject. What the fourth political theory is, in terms of what it opposes, is now clear. It is neither fascism, nor communism, nor liberalism. In principle, this kind of negation is rather significant. It embodies our determination to go beyond the usual ideological and political paradigms and to make an effort to overcome the inertia of the clichés within political thinking. This alone is a highly stimulating invitation for a free spirit and a critical mind. I do not really understand why certain people, when confronted with the concept of the fourth political theory, do not immediately rush to open a bottle of champagne and do not start dancing and rejoicing celebrating the discovery of new possibilities. After all, this is a kind of a philosophical new year an exciting leap into the unknown. The old year witnessed the struggle of the three political ideologies one of which was so bloody that it claimed millions of lives. All the criticism of liberalism was either fascist or communist. These critical approaches have been left behind, but the oldest of these ideologies liberalism is still here. Liberalism is the remnant of the old year, it is residuo, an uncertain past that was not properly sent to oblivion. It has already passed, but does not want to leave permanently in any way. In short, it is a chimera, the dragon that swallowed the sun, or the evil spirits that kidnapped the snow maiden before the new year. In a sense, liberalism embodies everything that was in the past. The fourth political theory is the name for a breakthrough and a new beginning. Underscoring the relevance of this criticism, and especially highlighting the fact that this is a radical rejection of all three political theories, liberalism, communism, and fascism, and their variants, I suggest we meditate on the positive aspects of the fourth political theory. The fact that we have identified what we oppose is, in itself, a significant achievement and requires a thorough understanding. The very idea of putting an end to fascism, communism, and liberalism is an extremely liberating thing. The fourth political theory proclaims, say no to fascism, no to communism, and no to liberalism. Liberalism will not work. It will not pass. No Pazarin, much like fascism once failed, no Hapasado. The Berlin Wall, too, collapsed. Only dust remains from the only visible barrier put up by communists to separate themselves from the liberal capitalists. The communists did not pass, either. What remains is not for liberals to pass and they will not pass. But in order for them not to pass, the fragments of the Berlin Wall are insufficient for us, as the wall itself was insufficient. The wall existed, but they still passed. 
Even less helpful are the dark shadows of the Third Reich, its Nezelezny, inspiring only the brutal punk youth and the perverted dreams of sadomasochist. Consequently, we suggest moving beyond the nihilistic phase of the fourth political theory toward something constructive. Once the three political theories as a systematized whole have been discarded, we can try to look at them from a different perspective. They are being rejected precisely as complete ideological systems, each on the basis of separate arguments. Like any system, they consist of elements that do not belong to them. The three political ideologies own their unique philosophical systems, groups, explanatory methodologies, and represent a whole which is a structure derived from their hermeneutic circle and their fundamental beliefs. They are what they are as a whole. Dismembered into components, they lose their significance and become meaningless. Liberalism, Marxism, socialist or communist, and fascism, including national socialism, are not components of overarching liberal, Marxist, or fascist ideologies. It is not that they are completely neutral, but outside of their strict ideological context, one can find or discover a different, or new, meaning for them. The positive aspects of the development of the fourth political theory are based on this principle. A revision of the three political ideologies and an analysis of each in unconventional ways can give certain clues to the substantive content of our own theory. In each of the three ideologies there is a clearly defined historical subject. In liberal ideology, the historical subject is the individual. The individual is conceived as a unit that is rational and endowed with a will, morality. The individual is both a given and the goal of liberalism. It is a given, but one that is often unaware of its identity as an individual. All forms of collective identity ethnic, national, religious, caste, and so on impede an individual's awareness of his individuality. Liberalism encourages the individual to become himself, that is, to be free of all those social identities and dependencies that constrain and define the individual from outside. This is the meaning of liberalism, in English, liberty, in Latin, libertas the call to become liberated, Latin, liber, from all things external to oneself. Moreover, liberal theorists, in particular, John Stuart Mill, underscored the fact that we are talking about a freedom from about the release from ties, identifications, and restrictions that are an imposition upon the individual's will. As for what the purpose of this freedom is, liberals remain silent. To assert some kind of a normative goal is, in their eyes, to restrict the individual and his freedom. Therefore, they strictly separate a freedom from, which they regard as a moral imperative of social development, from the freedom for the normativization of how, why, and for what purpose this freedom should be used. The latter remains at the discretion of the historical subject in other words, the individual. The historical subject of the second political theory is class. The class structure of society and the conflict between the exploiter and the exploited classes are the core of the communists' dramatic vision of history. History is class struggle. Politics is its expression. The proletariat is a dialectic historical subject, which is called to set itself free from the domination of the bourgeoisie and to build a society on new foundations. A single individual is conceived here as a part of a class-based whole and acquires social existence only in the process of raising class consciousness. And finally, the subject of the third political theory is either the state, as in Italian fascism, or race, as in German National Socialism. In fascism, everything is based upon a right-wing version of Hegelianism, since Hegel himself considered the Prussian state to be the peak of historical development in which the subjective spirit was perfected. Giovanni Gentile, a proponent of Hegelianism, applied this concept to fascist Italy. In German National Socialism, the historical subject is the Aryan race, which, according to racists, carries out the eternal struggle against the subhuman races. The appalling consequences of this ideology are too well known to dwell upon them. However, it was this original definition of a historical subject that was at the heart of the Nazis' criminal practices. The definition of a historical subject is the fundamental basis for political ideology in general and defines its structure. 
Therefore, in this matter, the fourth political theory may act in the most radical way by rejecting all of these constructions as candidates for a historical subject. The historical subject is neither an individual nor class nor the state nor race. This is the anthropological and the historical axiom of the fourth political theory. We assume that it is clear to us who or what cannot be the historical subject. But then who or what can? We cleared a space and correctly posed the question. We specified the problem of clarifying the historical subject in the fourth political theory. Now there is a gaping void, which is extremely interesting and significant. Heading into the depths of this void, we propose four hypotheses, which are not mutually exclusive, and which can be examined both collectively and individually. The first hypothesis suggests abandoning all types of contenders for the role of a historical subject from classical political theory, assuming that the subject of the fourth political theory is some type of compound not the individual, class, state, race, or nation on their own, but instead, a certain combination thereof. This is the hypothesis of a compound subject. The second hypothesis is to approach the problem from the standpoint of phenomenology. Let us place all that we know about the historical subject outside the framework of classical ideologies, carry out the Husserlian method of epochy, and try to empirically define that life world which will open up before us the life world of the political, one free from metaphysics or theology. Is it possible to consider political history without a subject? History is such. After all, theoretically, there were historical periods when politics existed, but when there was no subject in the philosophical, Cartesian sense. Of course, in hindsight, even this pre-subject in political history was reinterpreted in accordance with various ideologies. But if we no longer trust ideologies, such as the three political theories, then their historic reconstruction is not an axiom for us. If we consider political history in the style of the Annals School, for non brodel's method, then we have the chance to discover a rather polyphonic picture, expanding our understanding of the subject. In the spirit of Peter Berger, we can open up the prospect of desecularization, throughout history, Religious organizations frequently act as political subjects, or, together with Carl Schmitt, we can rethink the influence of tradition on a political decision, in the spirit of Schmitt's doctrine of decisionism. Discarding the dogma of progress will reveal a wide range of political actors, operating up until and beyond the new age, which fits into the conservative approach. But we are free to continue our open search for what may replace the historical subject in the future perhaps in the exotic hypotheses of Deleuze and Guattari about the rhizome, a body without organs, micropolitics, and so on, or on the horizon of proto-history with Baudrillard and Derrida, text, deconstruction, difference, etc. They offer us new and this time, not entirely conservative capabilities. Therefore, it is not worthwhile to reject them in advance, simply on the basis of their author's sympathies toward Marxism and their leftist affiliation. The third hypothesis is about forcing the phenomenological method and rushing several steps ahead, we may propose to consider Heidegger's Dacian as the subject of the fourth political theory. Dacian is described in Heidegger's philosophy at length through its existential structure, which makes it possible to build a complex, holistic model based on it, the development of which will lead to, for instance, a new understanding of politics. Many researchers have lost sight of the fact that Heidegger, especially in his middle period between 1936 and 1945, developed a complete history of philosophy centered around Dacian, which it has become apparent in retrospect, can form the basis of a full-fledged and well-developed political philosophy. Thus, accepting the Dacian hypothesis immediately gives us a broad map in order to navigate the construction of history necessary for political theory. If the subject is Dacian, then the fourth political theory would constitute a fundamental ontological structure that is developed on the basis of existential anthropology. We can map out the direction to describe this type of an approach. Dacian and the State Dacian and Social Stratification Dacian in power, the will to power. Being in politics. 
the horizons of political temporality, existential spatiality and the phenomenology of boundaries, the prince and nothing, parliament, the choice and being towards death, citizenship and the role of the guardians of being, referendum and intentionality, the authentic and the inauthentic in jurisprudence, existential philosophy of jurisprudence, revolution and the flight of the gods, urbanization and the house of being. Naturally, this is merely a cursory outline of the areas of interest for the new political science. The fourth hypothesis appeals to the concept of the imagination, el imaginaire. This topic is covered in detail in the works of Gilbert Durand, the basic ideas of which I discuss in my new work Sociology of the Imagination. Imagination as a structure precedes the individual, the collective, class, culture, and race, if race exists as a sociological phenomenon, which is uncertain as well as the state. According to Durand, who developed the ideas of Carl Gustav Jung and Gaston Bachelard, the imagination forms the content of human existence based on the internal, original, and independent structures that are embedded in it. The interpretation of political processes in history a posteriori is of no difficulty for the sociology of the imagination, and it produces impressive results. If we interpret the imagination as an autonomous actor in the political sphere, including its ability to project, and grant it a sort of a legal status, then we end up with an extraordinarily fascinating and totally undeveloped trajectory. Even though the students of 1968 demanded freedom for the imagination, in that moment they were unlikely to recognize the imagination as a contender for special political subjectivity. They remained trapped in the individual as part of liberalism, even if of the left and class, for example, Marxism, although strictly reconsidered on the basis of psychoanalysis. In the search for the subject of the fourth political theory, we must boldly enter into a new hermeneutic circle. The fourth political theory is the whole, which, naturally, has not yet been sufficiently described and defined. It is comprised of the ideas of its subject, which has been suggested in a preliminary fashion. But moving constantly between the uncertainty of the whole and the uncertainty of its parts and back again, we gradually begin to clarify more precisely what is at stake. This process, starting from the standpoint of dismissing that which came before it, the rejection of the old hermeneutic circles, liberalism and the individual, Marxism and class, fascism slash Nazism and the state slash race, will lead to the development of a more constructive idea sooner or later. Its structure will be further clarified when its hermeneutics comes up against explicitly absurd contradictions which cannot be resolved, or else stops corresponding to the real world. That is, after starting from a certain point, the development of the fourth political theory will begin to develop scientific and rational characteristics, which, for the time being, are barely discernible behind the power of its groundbreaking intuitions and its revolutionary, Herculean task of overcoming the old ideologies. The entire hermeneutic circle of the fourth political theory should be included in the fourth nomos of the earth. This inclusion will specify its content in even more detail and, in particular, will reveal the colossal epistemological potential of geopolitics. The latter, in addition to its purely practical and applied objectives, can be viewed as a broad invitation to think spatially in a postmodern scenario when historical thinking, which dominated the modern era, is becoming irrelevant. On numerous occasions, I have written about the philosophical and the sociological potential of geopolitics in my works. Spatiality is one of the most important existential components of Dacian, so the appeal to the fourth nomos of the earth can be tied to the third subject hypothesis of the fourth political theory. Now we can approach the problem of creating the fourth political theory from another direction and examine the contenders for inclusion in this theory from the three classical models. However, before determining which aspects of the three old ideologies can be borrowed from them, having neutralized them and taken them out of context, ripping them out of their own hermeneutic circle, it is important to briefly mention which aspects must be firmly discarded. If we begin with fascism and national socialism, then here we must definitively reject all forms of racism. 
Racism is what caused the collapse of National Socialism in the historical, geopolitical, and theoretical sense. This was not only a historical, but also a philosophical collapse. Racism is based on the belief in the innate objective superiority of one human race over another. It was racism, and not some other aspect of National Socialism, that brought about such consequences, leading to immeasurable suffering on both sides, as well as the collapse of Germany and the Axis powers, not to mention the destruction of the entire ideological project of the Third Way. The criminal practice of wiping out entire ethnic groups, Jews, Gypsies, and Slavs, based on race was precisely rooted in their racial theory this is what angers and shocks us about Nazism to this day. In addition, Hitler's anti-Semitism, and the doctrine that Slavs are subhuman and must be colonized, is what led Germany to go to war against the Soviet Union, which cost us millions of lives. It is also true that this resulted in the Germans themselves losing their political freedom and the right to participate in political history for a long time, if not forever. Today they are left only with their economy and, in the best-case scenario, with a concern for ecology. The supporters of the Third Way were left in the position of ideological outcasts on the margins of society. It was racism in theory and in practice that criminalized all other aspects of National Socialism and Fascism, causing these worldviews to become the object of curses and vilification. Hitler's racism, however, is only one form of racism this type of racism is the most obvious, straightforward, and biological, and therefore the most repulsive. There are other forms of racism cultural, asserting that there are high and low cultures, civilizational, dividing people into those civilized and those insufficiently civilized, technological, viewing technological development as the main criterion for the value of a society, social, stating, in the spirit of the Protestant doctrine of predestination, that the rich are the best and the greatest as compared to the poor, economic, in which all humanity is ranked according to the degree of material well-being and evolutionary, for which it is axiomatic that human society is the result of biological development in which the basic processes of the evolution of species survival of the fittest, natural selection, and so on continue today. European and American societies are fundamentally afflicted with these types of racism, unable to eradicate them from itself despite intensive efforts. Being fully aware of how revolting this phenomenon is, people in the West tend to make racism a taboo. However, all this turns into a witch hunt new pariahs accused of fascism are its victims, often for no apparent reason. Thus, this very political correctness and its norms are transformed into a totalitarian discipline of political, purely racist exclusions. In this manner, the institutionalized French left liberal anti-racism has gradually become the distribution center of racial hatred. Even Africans suffer from being accused of fascism. Such was the case of the unrestrained defamatory campaign against a well-known black comedian, Diudon Mbala Mbala, who dared to mock certain hideous features of the contemporary French establishment in his routines, including anti-racism, Rosslofront, SOS racism, etc. And then what? African comedian Mbala Mbala was categorized as brown, that is, accused of fascism and racism. The newest types of racism are glamour, fashion, and the latest trends in information technology. Its norms are set by models, designers, the socialites of political parties, and those who insist on owning only the latest models of mobile phones or laptop computers. Conformity or nonconformity with the glamour code is located at the very base of the mass strategies for social segregation and cultural apartheid. Today, this is not associated directly with the economic factor, but is gradually gaining independent sociological features, this is the ghost of the glamour dictatorship the new generation of racism. The very ideology of progress is racist in its structure. The assertion that the present is better and more fulfilling than the past, and continual assurances that the future will be even better than the present, are discriminations against the past and the present, as well as the humiliation of all those who lived in the past, an insult to the honor and dignity of our ancestors and those of others, and a violation of the rights of the dead. 
In many cultures, the dead play an important sociological role. They are considered to still be alive in a certain sense, present in this world, and participating in its life. This is true of all ancient cultures and civilizations. Billions of inhabitants on this earth believe in this concept to this day. In Chinese civilization, which was built upon the cult of the dead and upon their reverence alongside the living, being dead is regarded as a high social status, in some ways superior to the status of the living. The ideology of progress represents the moral genocide of past generations in other words, real racism. Equally questionable is the idea of modernization, when it is taken as a self-evident virtue. It is easy to detect the obvious signs of racism in it. Undoubtedly racist is the idea of unipolar globalization. It is based on the idea that the history and values of Western, and especially American, society are equivalent to universal laws and artificially tries to construct a global society based on what are actually local and historically specific values democracy, the market, parliamentarianism, capitalism, individualism, human rights, and unlimited technological development. These values are local ones, emerging from the particular development of a single culture and globalization is trying to impose them onto all of humanity as something that is universal and taken for granted. This attempt implicitly argues that the values of all other peoples and cultures are imperfect, underdeveloped, and should be subject to modernization and standardization in imitation of the Western model. Globalization is thus nothing more than a globally deployed model of Western European, or rather, Anglo-Saxon ethnocentrism which is the purest manifestation of racist ideology. As one of its essential features, the fourth political theory rejects all forms and varieties of racism and all forms of the normative hierarchization of societies based on ethnic, religious, social, technological, economic, or cultural grounds. Societies can be compared, but we cannot state that any one of them is objectively better than the others. Such an assessment is always subjective, and any attempt to raise a subjective assessment to the status of a theory is racism. This type of an attempt is unscientific and inhumane. The differences between societies in any sense can, in no shape or form, imply the superiority of one over the other. This is a central axiom of the fourth political theory. Furthermore, if anti-racism directly opposes the ideology of national socialism, in other words, the third political theory, then it also indirectly attacks communism, with its class hatred, as well as liberalism, with its progressivism as well as its inherent forms of economic, technological, and cultural racism. Instead of a unipolar world, the fourth political theory insists upon a multipolar world, and instead of universalism, on pluriversalism which Alain de Benoist brilliantly pointed out in his book. Clearly highlighting the main trajectory for the rejection of all forms and varieties of racism, including the biological theories inherent in National Socialism, we can identify what the fourth political theory may borrow from it. Strongly rejecting any suggestion of racism, we, in fact, destroy the hermeneutic circle of National Socialist ideology and neutralize its content, undermining its integrity and key foundations. Without racism, National Socialism is no longer National Socialism, either theoretically or practically, and becomes harmless and decontaminated. We can now proceed without fear to analyze it objectively in search of those ideas within it that could be integrated into the fourth political theory. We note a positive attitude toward the ethnos, an ethnocentrism directed toward that type of existence which is formed within the structure of the ethnos itself, and which remains intact throughout a variety of stages, including the highly differentiated types of societies which a people may develop in the course of their history. This topic has found deep resonance in certain philosophical directions of the conservative revolution, for instance, Carl Schmitt and his theory of the rights of peoples, in Adam Muller, Arthur Moeller van den Bruck, and so on, or the German School of Ethnic Sociology, Wilhelm Moman, Richard Thurnwald, and others. Ethnos is the greatest value of the fourth political theory as a cultural phenomenon, as a community of language, religious belief, daily life, and the sharing of resources and goals.
as an organic entity written into an accommodating landscape, Lev Gumilev, as a refined system for constructing models for married life, as an always unique means of establishing a relationship with the outside world, as the matrix of the life world, Edmund Husserl, and as the source of all the language. Games, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Of course, ethnicity was not the focal point either in National Socialism or in Fascism. Yet liberalism as an ideology, calling for the liberation from all forms of collective identity in general, is entirely incompatible with the ethnos and ethnocentrism and is an expression of a systemic theoretical and technological ethnocide. Marxist ideology did not pay much attention to the ethnos either believing that the ethnos is overcome in a class-based society, and that no trace of it remains in a bourgeois and, even more so, a proletarian society. Based on the latter, the principle of proletarian internationalism becomes absolute. The only place where the ethnos received any kind of attention is in dissident, third-way currents which were rather marginal in relation to the political mainstream even though Nazi orthodoxy blocked the organic development of the ethnosociological subject area with its racist dogma. Whatever the case may be, the ethnos and ethnocentrism, Wilhelm Moman, have every reason to be considered as candidates for the becoming the subject of the fourth political theory. At the same time, we must again and again pay attention to the fact that we view the ethnos in the plural, Without trying to establish any kind of a hierarchical system, ethnicities are different, but each of them is, in itself, universal. Ethnicities live and develop, but this life and this development do not fit into one specific paradigm, they are open and always distinct. Ethnicities mix and separate, but neither one nor the other is good or evil per se. Ethnicities themselves generate the criteria by which others are judged, each time in a different way. We can draw many conclusions based on this point. In particular, we can relativize the very notion of politics, which comes from the normative values of the city, the polis, and, consequently, of the urban model of self-organization within the community, or the society. As a general paradigm, we can review what Richard Thurnwald called Dorfstadt a village state. The village state is an alternative view of politics from the perspective of the ethnos naturally living in balance with its environment. This view is not reflective of the city, projecting its structure onto the rest of the country, but is that of the village or the province. It comes from the standpoint of those regions that have been peripheral in classical politics, but which are the center of the fourth political theory. However, this is only one example of all the possibilities that open up if we accept the ethnos as the historical subject. Yet even this shows the possibilities inherent in transforming even the most basic political concepts and how drastic the revision of an established dogma can be. Now let us discuss what could be taken from communism, the second political theory. First, however, let us decide on what should be discarded in order to demolish its hermeneutic circle. First and foremost, the communist theories regarding historical materialism and the notion of unidirectional progress are inapplicable to our purposes. We have previously talked about the racist element, which is embedded in the idea of progress. It looks particularly revolting within historical materialism, which not only prioritizes the future ahead of the past, brutally violating the rights of the ancestors, but also equates the living human society, Richard Thurnwald, with a mechanical system operating independently of humanity, according to laws that are monotonic and uniform for all. Materialist reductionism and economic determinism comprise the most repulsive aspect of Marxism. In practice, it was expressed through the destruction of the spiritual and religious heritage of those societies in which Marxism came to dominate. An arrogant contempt for the past, a vulgar materialist interpretation of spiritual culture, a focus exclusively upon economic factors, a positive attitude toward the process of creating a social differential through the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the idea of class as the only historical subject the fourth political theory rejects all these aspects of Marxism. However, without these components, Marxism, and, more generally, socialism, ceases to be itself, and, consequently, it is rendered harmless as a full-fledged ideology, 
breaking into separate components that do not represent a single whole. Marxism is relevant in terms of its description of liberalism in identifying the contradictions of capitalism in its criticism of the bourgeois system and in revealing the truth behind the bourgeois democratic policies of exploitation and enslavement which are presented as development and liberation. Marxism's critical potential is highly useful and applicable. It may well be included in the arsenal of the fourth political theory. But if so, Marxism will not appear as an ideology that provides answers to a full range of emerging issues answers that are rational and axiomatic in their foundation but as an expressive myth or a witty sociological method. The Marxism which we can accept is mythic, sociological Marxism. As a myth, Marxism tells us the story of the original state of paradise, primitive communism, which was gradually lost, the initial division of labor, and the stratification of the primitive society. Then the contradictions grew, moving toward the point when, at the end of this world, they were reincarnated, in their most paradigmatically pure form, as the confrontation between labor and capital. Capital the bourgeoisie and liberal democracy personified global evil, exploitation, alienation, lies, and violence. Labor embodied a great dream and an ancient memory of the common good and its acquisition, the surplus value, by an evil minority gave birth to all the problems of modern life. Labor, the proletariat, must recognize the paradoxes inherent in this state of affairs and rise up against their masters in order to build a new society a new paradise on earth, communism. Only this will not be the naturally occurring primitive communism, but an artificial, scientific kind in which the differential, accumulated over centuries and millennia of alienation, will serve the commune, the community. In this way, the dream will become a reality. This myth fits neatly into the structure of eschatological consciousness, which occupies a significant place in mythologies of all tribes and peoples, not to mention the highly differentiated religions. That alone speaks in its favor in order for us to treat it with the utmost consideration. On the other hand, as sociology, Marxism is tremendously useful in revealing those mechanisms of alienation and mystification that liberalism uses to justify its dominion and as proof of its correctness. Being a myth itself, in its polemical, activist form, Marxism serves as an excellent tool to expose the bourgeois great stories in order to overthrow the credibility of liberal pathos. And in this capacity against liberalism it can be used effectively under the new conditions, after all, we continue to exist under capitalism and hence, Marxist criticism of it, and the struggle against it, remain on the agenda, even if the old forms of this struggle have become irrelevant. Marxism is often correct when it describes its enemy, especially the bourgeoisie. However, its own attempts to understand itself lead to failure. The first and the most prominent contradiction is Marx's unfulfilled prediction about the type of societies that are the most prone to socialist revolutions. He was confident that this would take place in the greatly industrialized countries of Western Europe, which had a high level of manufacturing and contained a large proportion of urban proletariat. Such revolutions were considered impossible in agrarian countries, as well as those countries with an Asiatic mode of production, due to their supposed backwardness. In the 20th century, everything occurred exactly to the contrary. Socialist revolutions and socialist societies developed in agrarian countries which had a traditional, rural population, while nothing similar occurred in any of the highly developed nations of Europe and America. However, even in those countries where socialism was victorious, Marxist dogma did not allow for a rethinking of its basic logical assumptions, such as to reconsider the role of pre-industrial factors or to honestly evaluate the real power of myth. In its Western and Soviet versions, Marxism's self-reflection turned out to be questionable and inaccurate. While justifiably criticizing liberalism, Marxism was seriously mistaken about itself, which, at some point, doomed its own fate. It eventually collapsed even in those places where it had triumphed. And in those areas where Marx had expected it to win, capitalism prevailed, the proletariat dissolved into the middle class, and disappeared inside the consumer society, 
contrary to expectations and predictions. In the end, European revolutionary communists turned into petty bourgeois clowns, entertaining the bored and jaded democratic public. If Marxism itself was unable to look at itself from the proper standpoint, then nothing prevents us from doing so in the context of the fourth political theory. Alain de Benoist has a classic book entitled Vue de Droit, A View from the Right, in which he suggested the rereading of various political writers, both from the right and the left, from the point of view of the new right. This book led to the inception of the new right movement in Europe. It contains not only a critique of those ideas which served as dogma for the old right, but also a revolutionary and well-meant reading of such authors as the communist Antonio Gramsci, examined from the point of view of the right. It is precisely this reading of Marx from the right, from the standpoint of myths, and from archaic and holistic sociology, that would be particularly fitting at the present time. Finally, what can we take from liberalism? And here, as always, we must begin with those aspects that must not be borrowed. Perhaps, in this case, everything is described clearly and in a fairly detailed manner in Alain de Benoist's work against liberalism, toward the fourth political theory, to which I keep constantly and consciously referring in my explanation. Liberalism is the main enemy of the fourth political theory, which is being constructed specifically to be in total opposition to it. Yet even here, as was the case with the other political theories, there is something important and something secondary. Liberalism as a whole rests on the individual as its most basic component. It is these individuals, collectively, but in isolation from one another, that are taken as the whole. It is, perhaps, for this reason that the hermeneutic circle of liberalism turned out to be the most durable, it has the smallest orbit and rotates around its subject the individual. In order to shatter this circle, we must strike the individual, abolish him, and cast him into the periphery of political considerations. Liberalism is well aware of this danger and therefore undertakes one battle after another with all other ideologies and theories social, philosophical, and political that encroach on the individual inscribing his identity into a more general context. The neuroses and fears located at the pathogenic core of liberal philosophy are clearly seen in the open society and its enemies, a classic of neoliberalism by Karl Popper. He compared fascism and communism based precisely on the fact that both ideologies integrate the individual into a supra-individual community, into a whole, into a totality, which Popper immediately qualified as totalitarianism. Having undermined the individual as the constitutive figure of the entire political and social system, we can put an end to liberalism. Of course, this is not that easy to achieve. Nevertheless, it is now obvious that the weakest and the strongest aspect of the first political theory comes from its direct appeal to the individual pleading that he remain himself by himself in his own autonomous individuality, uniqueness, particularity, and partiality. In any case, the fourth political theory can interpret Popper's phobias in its favor. This led him and his followers to anecdotal conclusions, quite telling are his feeble-minded criticisms of Hegel in the spirit of a smear campaign, and the accusations of fascism directed toward Plato and Aristotle. Understanding what the enemy fears the most, we propose the theory that every human identity is acceptable and justified, except for that of the individual. Man is anything but an individual. We must look carefully at a liberal when he reads or hears an axiom of this kind. I think this will be an impressive spectacle all his tolerance will instantly evaporate. Human rights will be distributed to anyone, just not the one who dares to utter something along these lines. This however, I described in more detail in my essay Maximal Humanism as well as in my book, The Philosophy of Politics. Liberalism must be defeated and destroyed, and the individual must be thrown off his pedestal. Yet is there anything that we could take away from liberalism from this liberalism that is hypothetically defeated and has lost its axis? Yes, there is. It is the idea of freedom. And not just the idea of freedom for that same substantive freedom rejected by Mill in his liberal program, which concentrated on the freedom from. 
we must say yes to freedom in all its meanings and in all its perspectives. The fourth political theory should be a theory of absolute freedom but not as in Marxism, in which it coincides with absolute necessity, this correlation denies freedom its very core. No, freedom can be of any kind, free of any correlation or lack thereof, facing any direction and any goal. Freedom is the greatest value of the fourth political theory, since it coincides with its center and its dynamic, energetic core. The difference is that this freedom is conceived as human freedom, not as freedom for the individual as the freedom given by ethnocentrism and the freedom of Dacian, the freedom of culture and the freedom of society, and the freedom for any form of subjectivity except for that of an individual. Moving in the opposite direction, European thought long ago came to a different conclusion, man, as an individual, is a prison without walls, John Paul Sartre, that is to say, the freedom of an individual is a prison. In order to attain true freedom, we must go beyond the limits of the individual. In this sense, the fourth political theory is a theory of liberation, of going beyond the prison walls into the outside world, which begins where the jurisdiction of individual identity ends. Freedom is always fraught with chaos, but is also open to opportunities. Placed into the narrow framework of individuality, the amount of freedom becomes microscopic and, ultimately, fictitious. The individual is granted freedom because the uses to which he can put it are extremely limited it will remain contained within the tiny scope of his individuality and that over which he has direct control. This is the flip side of liberalism, at its core. It is totalitarian and intolerant of differences and most especially opposed to the realization of a great will. It is only prepared to tolerate small people. It protects not so much the rights of man, but rather, the rights of a small man. This small man can be allowed to do anything, but in spite of all his desire, he will be unable to do anything. Yet, beyond the small man, on the other side of minimal humanism, one can just glimpse the closest horizon of genuine freedom. However, it is also there that great risk and serious dangers emerge. Having left the limits of individuality, man can be crushed by the elements of life and by dangerous chaos. He may want to establish order. And this is entirely within his right the right of a great man, Homo Maximus, a real man of being in time, Martin Heidegger. And, like any order, this possible order, the coming order may be embodied in individual forms. Nonetheless, this is not individuality, but individuation, not empty rotations around that which has been received from the liberal authorities and which is meaningless, but the actual execution of tasks, as well as the taming of the restless and exciting horizons of the will. The bearer of freedom in this case will be Dacian. The previous ideologies, each in its own way, alienated Dacian from its meaning, restricted it, and imprisoned it in one way or another, making it inauthentic. Each of these ideologies put a cheerless doll, Das Man, in the place of Dacian. The freedom of Dacian lies in implementing the opportunity to be authentic, that is, in the realization of saying more so than of da their being consists of there and of being. In order to understand where this there is located, we should point it out and make a basic, foundational gesture. Yet in order for being to flow into there like a fountain, we must place all of this together place this entire hermeneutic circle into the domain of complete freedom. Therefore, the fourth political theory is, at the same time, a fundamental ontological theory which contains the awareness of the truth of being at its core. Without freedom, we cannot force anyone to exist. Even if we build the optimal society, and even if we force everyone to act appropriately and to operate within the framework of the correct paradigm, we could never guarantee such an outcome. This results from a man's freedom to choose being. Of course, most often, man gravitates toward the inauthentic existence of Dacian, trying to dodge the issue, to succumb to gossip, jareed, and to self-mockery. Liberated Dacian may not choose the path to being, may hide in shelter, and may, once again, clutter the world with its hallucinations and fears, and its concerns and intentions. Choosing Dacian may corrupt the fourth political theory itself, turning it into a self-parody. 
This is a risk, but being is a risk too. The only question is who risks what. You risk everything, or everything and everyone puts you at risk. Yet only that which increases freedom will make the choice of authentic being a reality only then will the stakes be truly great, when the danger is infinite. Unlike other political theories, the fourth political theory does not want to lie, soothe, or seduce. It summons us to live dangerously, to think riskily, to liberate and to release all those things that cannot be driven back inside. The fourth political theory trusts the fate of being and entrusts fate to being. Any strictly constructed ideology is always a simulacrum and always inauthentic, that is to say, it always is the lack of freedom. Therefore, the fourth political theory should not hurry in order to become a set of basic axioms. Perhaps, it is more important to leave some things unsaid, to be discovered in expectations and insinuations, in allegations and premonitions. The fourth political theory should be completely open. Three. The critique of monotonic processes. The idea of modernization is based on the idea of progress. When we use the term modernization, we certainly mean progress, linear accumulation, and a certain continuous process. When we speak of modernization, we presuppose development, growth, and evolution. This is the same semantic system. Thus, when we speak of the unconditionally positive achievements of modernization, we agree with a very important basic paradigm we agree with the idea that human society is developing, progressing, evolving, growing, and getting better and better. That is to say, we share a particular vision of historical optimism. This historical optimism pertains to the three classical political ideologies, liberalism, communism, and fascism. It is rooted in the scientific, societal, political, and social worldview in the humanities and natural sciences of the 18th and 19th centuries, when the idea of progress, development, and growth was taken as an axiom that could not be doubted. In other words, this entire set of axioms, as well as the whole historiography and predictive analytics of the 19th century in the humanities and the natural sciences, was built on the idea of progress. We can easily trace the development of this subject the idea of progress in the three political ideologies. Let us turn to the classical liberalism of the sociologist Herbert Spencer. He claimed that the development of human society is the next stage of the evolution of the animal species and that there is a connection and a continuity between the animal world and social development. And, therefore, all the laws of the animal world leading to development, improvement, and evolution in the animal world within Darwin's framework can be projected onto society. This is the basis of the famous theory, social Darwinism, of which Spencer was a classic representative. If, according to Darwin, the driving force behind the evolution of the animal kingdom is the struggle for survival and natural selection, then the same process must take place in society argued Spencer. And, the more perfect this struggle is for survival, interspecies, intraspecies, the struggle of the strong against the weak, the competition for resources, pleasure, the more perfect our society becomes. The question is how to aid this process of selection. According to Spencer, this is the central theme of the liberal model and is the meaning of social progress. Therefore, if we are liberals, in one way or the other, we inherited this zoological approach to social development based on the struggle against and the destruction of the weak by the strong. However, Spencer's theory contains one important point. He argued that there are two phases of social development. The first phase occurs when the struggle for survival is conducted crudely, by force, this is characteristic of the ancient world. The second occurs when the struggle is carried out more subtly through economic means. Once the bourgeois revolution takes place, the struggle for survival does not stop. According to Spencer, it acquires new, more advanced, and more efficient forms, it relocates into the sphere of the market. Here, the strongest survive that is, the richest. Instead of the most powerful feudal lord, a hero, a strong person, or a leader, who simply seizes all that is up for grabs around his community, 
taking away all that belongs to other nations and races and sharing it with the ruling ethnicity or caste. Now comes the capitalist, who brings the same aggressive animal principle to the market, the corporation, and the trading company. The transition from the order of power to the order of money, according to Spencer, does not mean the humanization of the process, but only underscores greater effectiveness. That is to say, the struggle in the market sphere between the strong, meaning rich, and the weak, meaning poor, becomes more efficient and leads to higher levels of development until super-rich, super-strong, and super-developed countries appear. Progress, according to Spencer, and more broadly speaking, according to liberalism, is always the growth of economic power, since this continues to refine the struggle for survival of the animal species, the warfare methods of strong nations, and the castes within the framework of pre-capitalist states. Thus an animalistic form of aggression is embedded in the liberal idea of progress, which is regarded as the main trajectory of social development. With more economic freedom, there is greater power for takeovers, attacks, mergers and acquisitions. Liberal discourse, meaning the analysis of the liberal ideologist, is a completely animal discourse. In such a system, the more advanced law or the more advanced, more modern methods of production do not mean that they are more humane. What it means is that they allow more opportunities for the strong to more effectively realize their power, while the weak can only admit defeat, or, if they have any strength left, fight on. In this manner, the modern idea of economic growth, as we see in liberals such as Alan Greenspan and Ben Bernanke, has its foundation and origins in the idea of the struggle between species, that is, the feral destruction of the weak by the strong, or the validation of the strong at the expense of the weak. Only instead of the conflict between predators and herbivores, we have the golden billion, and in that golden billion, their own kings of beasts, the New York Stock Exchange and the World Bank bankers, who devour all that is up for grabs and, at the same time, turn the forests of the world into social infrastructures. Therefore, when we speak of modernization in the liberal vein, of necessity we mean the enhancement of the social, political, cultural, spiritual, and informational scenario within which the absolute aggression of the strong against the weak can be implemented. American liberal Ayn Rand, Greenspan was one of her greatest admirers, created an entire philosophy, called objectivism, based on the following blunt idea, if one is rich, then he is good. She reached the limits of Weber's idea about the origin of capitalism in the Protestant ethic and said that he who is rich is always and necessarily the good almost a saint, while the poor man is evil, lazy, bad, and corrupt a sinner. Being poor, according to Ayn Rand, is to be a sinful villain, whereas to be rich is to be a saint. She proposed to establish the conspiracy of the rich, meaning the strong, bright, sacred, and powerful capitalists, against any kind of labor movement, the peasants, and against all those who stand for social justice, or those who are simply poor. Such a crusade of the rich against the poor is the basis of the objectivist ideology. People like Greenspan and the current head of the United States Federal Reserve, Bernanke, are objectivists that is, those who interpret modernization, progress, economic growth, and development in the liberal vein. If we understand modernization like liberal Democrats, then that means that we are invited to join in this terrible struggle for survival at its greatest intensity, and to become just like them, trying to grab a place at the trough of globalization. Globalization, in this case, is the new battlefield in the struggle for survival, the struggle of the rich against the poor. Naturally, the ideologically philosophic and moral premise of this version of modernization is entirely alien to the Russian people in terms of our history and our culture. We reject this type of modernization unconditionally, and those who might try to impose it upon us will pay dearly for doing so. In communism, the idea of unidirectional progress is also present. Marx argued that changes in social structures, which lead to the improvement and development of societies and economies, will sooner or later result in the communist proletarian revolution, redistributing the accumulated wealth as a result of the development of alienating technologies. The expropriation of the expropriators will occur. Nevertheless, while this has not happened, Marxists say, 
let everything be as it may in the development of capitalism. Marx also saw history positively, as advancement and viewed it as a tale of growth and improvement, from the minus to the plus, from the simple to the complex. It is telling that the lion's share of the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels is devoted to criticizing specifically those anti-bourgeois political philosophies that differed from Marxism, first and foremost, those that are feudal, reactionary, and nationalistic. By doing so, Marx and Engels strove to emphasize that their communism was directed against the bourgeoisie in a manner different from the criticism by the right-wing anti-capitalists. In reality, compared to all the other reactionary and conservative projects, Marxists stand on the side of the bourgeoisie and seek to bring its victory closer, since it translates into the narrative of historical progress and the logic of modernization. For this reason, Marxism rejects conservatism in all of its forms. The contradictions between the communists and the capitalists acquire a particularly acute character as the triumph of capitalism becomes irreversible and complete. It is here that the communists enter history as the vanguard of the proletariat and push historical progress further along toward socialism and communism. Once again, we see Darwinism in Marxism, including the full acceptance of evolutionary ideas and its belief in the miraculous power of scientific progress and technological improvement. We live through this kind of modernization in the 20th century paid for it more than in full, the people clearly do not have the slightest desire to repeat such experiments. Therefore, this version of modernization will not work and moreover, no one speaks out in favor of it. Oddly enough, fascism, too, is an evolutionary movement. We may remember Friedrich Nietzsche, who spoke of the blonde beast and of the will to power that drives history. Nietzsche was an evolutionist and believed that, based on the logic of the development of species, man will be replaced by the superman, much like how man first came to replace the ape. He wrote, What is the ape to a human? A laughing stock or a painful embarrassment? And that is precisely what the human shall be to the overman, a laughing stock or a painful embarrassment. The National Socialists adapted a racial interpretation of this idea, that the white race is more developed than the black, yellow, or any other kind, and on this basis, has the right to rule the world. Here, we encounter the same progressivist outlook, along with the idea of development and improvement, all of which leads to the assumption of racial superiority on the grounds that the white nations own sophisticated instruments of industrial production, while other ethnic groups do not. Today, we reject and criticize fascism for its racial component, but we forget that this ideology is also built on the ideas of progress and evolution, just like the other two political theories of modernity. If we were to visualize the essence of Nazi ideology and the role of progress and evolution in it, then the connection between racism and evolution would become obvious to us. This connection in a concealed form can be seen in liberalism and even in communism. Even if not biological, we see cultural, technological, and economic racism in the ideology of the free market and in the dictatorship of the proletariat. In one way or another, all three ideologies originate from the same trend, the idea of growth, development, progress, evolution, and of the constant, cumulative improvement of society. They all view the world and the entire historical process as linear growth. They differ in their interpretation of this process, and they attribute different meanings to it, but they all accept the irreversibility of history and its progressive character. Thus, modernization is a concept that sends us back directly to the three classical political ideologies. Furthermore, we can see the common ground that unites the three ideologies through the idea of progress and in their positive evaluation of the concept of modernization. Nowadays, all three of these ideologies are being gradually discarded. This is strongly evident in regard to fascism and communism, but is somewhat less obvious with regard to liberalism but even liberalism is gradually ceasing to satisfy the majority of the world's population and, simultaneously, is turning into something other than what it was during the classical era of modernity. Consequently, it is about time that we pose the question of searching for the fourth political theory beyond the first three.
Additionally, the radical rejection of the three classical theories reflects our attitude toward what is common to them all that is, our attitude toward modernization, progress, evolution, development, and growth. The American scientist Gregory Bateson, a theorist of ethnosociology, cybernetics, and ecology, as well as a psychoanalyst and a linguist, described the monotonic process in his book Mind and Nature. The monotonic process is the idea of constant growth, constant accumulation, development, steady progress, all accompanied by the increase of only one specific indicator. In mathematics, this is associated with the ideas of the monotonic value, in other words, the ever-increasing value hence, monotonic functions. Monotonic processes are the type that always proceed in only one direction, for example, all their indicators consistently increase without cyclical fluctuations and oscillations. Studying the monotonic process at three levels at the level of biology, life, at the level of mechanics, steam engines, internal combustion engines, and at the level of social phenomena, Bateson concluded that when this process occurs in nature, it immediately destroys the species, if we are talking about an artificial device, it breaks down, if we mean a society, the society deteriorates and disappears. The monotonic process, in biology, is incompatible with life it is an antibiological phenomenon. Monotonic processes are completely absent from nature. All the processes which accumulate only one particular thing, or emphasize only one particular trait, result in death. Monotonic processes do not exist in any biological species, from cells to the most complex organisms. As soon as this kind of a monotonic process begins, deviants, giants, dwarfs, and other freaks of nature appear. They are disabled, incompatible with life, cannot produce offspring, and life itself casts them out. Solving the problem of monotonic processes was one of the most important problems in the development of steam engines. It turns out that the most important design element in steam engines is the centrifugal governor. When a steam engine reaches cruising speed, it is necessary to regulate the intake of fuel, otherwise the monotonic process initiates, everything begins to resonate, and the speed of the engine can increase indefinitely, causing it to explode. It was precisely this solution of avoiding the monotonic process in mechanics that was the principal theoretical, mathematical, physical, and engineering problem during the early stage of industrialization. It turns out that the monotonic process is not only incompatible with life, but also with the proper functioning of a mechanical device. The task of designing a device must avoid the monotonic process, that is, it must prevent one-dimensional progress, evolution, development, and the placement of growth into a closed cycle. By analyzing sociology, Bateson showed that there are no monotonic processes in real societies. Monotonic processes, such as population growth, in most cases led to wars, which then reduced the population. In our society today we see an unprecedented level of technological progress along with unbelievable moral degradation. If we look at all this evidence without the evolutionary bias, then we will realize that monotonic processes exist only in people's minds, in other words, they are purely ideological models. Bateson demonstrated that they do not exist in biological, mechanical, or social reality. Marcel Moss, a well-known French sociologist, criticized the monotonic process as well. In the book he co-authored, Sacrifice, Its Nature and Functions, and especially in his essay, The Gift, he showed that traditional societies paid great attention to the ritual destruction, or sacrifice, of surplus goods. The surplus was seen as excessive, leco, and usurious. Leco personifies evil, usury is the interest charged on borrowed capital, and excess is that which is obtained beyond one's needs. For instance, surplus crops were seen as disastrous in traditional society. The ancient worldview was based on the belief that an increase in one area translates into a decrease in another. Therefore, a surplus had to be destroyed as soon as possible. For this purpose, the community either organized a feast, consuming all the additional food until they choked, or else gave it to the gods in the form of a sacrifice, 
gave it out to the needy, or destroyed it. This is the origin of a special ritual, the potlatch, which brings about the deliberate gifting or destruction of excess personal property. Marcel Moss proved that the belief in the destructiveness of monotonic processes lies at the foundations of human sociality. The society remains strong only through the rejection of the monotonic process and by turning growth into a cycle. Emile Durkheim, Peter M. Sorokin, and George Gervich, the greatest sociologists of the 20th century, in essence the classicists of sociological thought, argued that social progress does not exist, in contrast to the 19th century sociologists, such as Auguste Kant or Herbert Spencer. Progress is not an objective social phenomenon, but rather, an artificial concept, a kind of scientifically formulated myth. When we study societies, we can only speak of the different types thereof. There is no general criterion to determine which is more developed and which is less so. Lucy and Levy Brohl attempted to prove that savages think pre-logically, while modern humans use logic. However, Claude Levi Strauss demonstrated that savages think in the same way that we do, only their taxonomy is built differently, so they do not have less logic than we do perhaps even more so, and they think in a more refined manner. As for the phases of social development, the greatest American cultural anthropologist, Franz Boas, and his followers, as well as Claude Levi Strauss and his school, proved that we cannot look at modern humans as being evolved from archaic and primitive tribes within the framework of anthropology. Primitives and primitive societies are simply different people and different societies. Modern humans are one group and archaic humans another. But they are people too, no worse than we are. They are not an underdeveloped version of us. They have different children who do not know myths and fairy tales since they are not taught them, in contrast to our children. The adults are also different, their adults do know the myths, whereas ours do not believe in them. Our adults, our sober and practical society, are more similar to their children. The adults in primitive tribes are capable of telling mythological stories, sincerely believe in them, and know that they embody the feats of their ancestors and their spirits in their own lives, making no distinction between them. In contrast, the children of primitive societies are characterized by cynicism, pragmatism, skepticism, and the desire to attribute everything to material causes. This does not mean that modern societies have grown from the state of primitivism and superseded it, it is just that we have configured our society differently, neither better or worse, and built it upon other foundations and other values. With regard to cultural studies and philosophy, Nikolai Danilevsky, Oswald Spengler, Carl Schmitt, Ernst Jünger, Martin Heidegger, and Arnold Toynbee showed that all the processes in the history of philosophy and the history of culture are a cyclical phenomenon. The Russian historian Lev Gumilev also suggested this in his version of cyclical history, which he explained in his famous theory of passionarity. They all acknowledge that there is development, but that there is also decline. Those who place bets on there being only growth and development act against all norms of history, against all sociological laws, and against the logic of life. Such unidirectional modernization, such growth, such development and such progress do not exist. Pyotr Stompka, a contemporary Polish sociologist, stated that, in terms of how progress was viewed, that there was a change in the humanities. In the 19th century, everyone believed that progress existed, and that it was the principal axiom and a scientific criterion. But if we examine the paradigms of the 20th century in the humanities and the natural sciences, then we will see that almost everyone rejected them, no one is guided by it any longer. Nowadays, the paradigm of progress is considered almost anti-scientific. It is incompatible with the criteria of contemporary science, just as it is incompatible with the criteria of humanism and tolerance. Any idea of progress is, in itself, a veiled or direct racism, asserting that our culture, for instance, the white culture or American culture, is of higher value than your culture, such as the culture of Africans, Muslims, Iraqis, or Afghans. 
As soon as we say that the American or the Russian culture is better than that of the Chukchi or the inhabitants of the Northern Caucasus, we act like racists. And this is incompatible with both science and with a basic respect toward different ethnicities. 20th century science uses cyclicality as a scientific criterion, or, according to Stompka, we have moved from the paradigm of evolution, modernization, and development to the paradigm of crisis and catastrophes. This means that all processes in nature, society, and technology must be conceived as relative, reversible, and cyclical. This is the most important point. In terms of its methodological base, the fourth political theory must be rooted in the fundamental rejection of the monotonic process. That is to say, the fourth political theory must assert that the monotonic process is unscientific, inadequate, amoral, and untrue as its future axiom, without specifying how the monotonic process must be rejected. And everything that appeals to the monotonic process and its variations, such as development, evolution, and modernization, should, at the very least, be understood in terms of the cyclical mode. Instead of the ideas of the monotonic process, progress, and modernization, we must endorse other slogans directed toward life, repetition, the preservation of that which is of value and changing that which should be changed. Instead of always looking for modernization and growth, we should instead orient ourselves in the direction of balance, adaptability, and harmony. Instead of desiring to move upward and forward, we must adapt to that which exists, to understand where we are, and to harmonize socio-political processes. And, most important, instead of growth, progress, and development, there is life. After all, there has been no proof offered yet to show that life is linked to growth. This was the myth of the 19th century. Life, in contrast, is connected to the eternal return. In the end, even Nietzsche incorporated his idea of the will to power into the concept of eternal return. The very logic of life to which Nietzsche was dedicated told him that if there is growth in life, the Apollonian movement toward the Logos, then the balance of the nocturnal Dionysian world exists as well. And Apollo is not just opposed to Dionysus, they complement each other. Half of the cycle constitutes modernization, while the other half decline. When one half faces up, the other half faces down. There is no life without death. Being towards death, careful attention to death, to the flip side of the sphere of being, as Heidegger wrote, is not a struggle with life, but rather, its glorification and its foundation. We must put an end to antiquated political ideologies and theories. If we have truly rejected Marxism and fascism, then what remains is to reject liberalism. Liberalism is an equally outdated, cruel, misanthropic ideology like the two previous ones. The term liberalism should be equated with the terms fascism and communism. Liberalism is responsible for no fewer historic crimes than fascism, Auschwitz, and communism, the gulag it is responsible for slavery, the destruction of the Native Americans in the United States, for Hiroshima and Nagasaki for the aggression in Serbia, Iraq, and Afghanistan, for the devastation and the economic exploitation of millions of people on the planet, and for the ignoble and cynical lies which whitewash this history. But most important, we must reject the base upon which these three ideologies stand, the monotonic process in all its forms, that is, evolution, growth, modernization, progress, development, and all that which seemed scientific in the 19th century, but was exposed as unscientific in the 20th century. We must also abandon the philosophy of development and propose the following slogan, life is more important than growth. Instead of the ideology of development, we must place our bets on the ideology of conservatism and conservation. However, we not only require conservatism in our daily lives, but also philosophical conservatism. We need the philosophy of conservatism. Looking toward the future of the Russian political system, if it is going to be based on monotonic processes, then it is doomed to failure. No stability will ever come from a new round of unidirectional growth derived from energy prices, real estate, stocks, and so on, nor from the growth of global economy as a whole.
If this illusion persists, then it may become fatal for our country. Today, we find ourselves in a transitional state. We know roughly what we are moving away from but do not know what we are moving toward. If we head toward that which directly or indirectly implies the belief in any monotonic process, then we will reach a dead end. The fourth political theory must take a step toward the formulation of a coherent critique of the monotonic process. It must develop an alternative model of a conservative future, a conservative tomorrow, based on the principles of vitality, roots, constants, and eternity. After all, as Arthur Moeller van den Bruck once said, conservatism has eternity on its side. For the reversibility of time. Three political theories have been produced from the ideology of modernity. They were all based on the topography of progress. Progress implicates the irreversibility of time, a forward-moving and predetermined evolutionary process. Progress is both an orthogenetic and a monotonic process. Inevitably, all three are based on Hegel's philosophy. After Hegel, the meaning of history became understood in terms of the absolute spirit becoming estranged from itself, assuming a form as the dialectic process of history, eventually becoming a type of enlightened monarchy. Marx accepted this topography, and after Alexander Kojiv and Francis Fukuyama, liberal thinkers have accepted it as well. In the framework of National Socialism, Hegelianism was externalized in the concept of a final Reich, with the Third Reich as the Third Kingdom of Joachim of Fiori, and in the concept of Social Darwinism, where the theory of natural selection has been adapted to apply to society and races. Social Darwinism is also inherent in Spencer's liberalism. Each of these three ideologies of modernity is based on the premises of the irreversibility of time and of unidirectional history. They implicitly acknowledge the totalizing imperative of modernization. Modernization can be liberal, communist, or fascist. An example of the effectiveness of fascist modernization would be the success, however brutal, of Hitler's industrial modernization of Germany in the 1930s. The fourth political theory is an unmodern theory. As Bruno Latour has said, we have never been contemporary. The theoretical axioms of modernity are harmless because they cannot be realized in reality. In practice, they are permanently and very spectacularly self-negating. The fourth political theory completely discards the idea of the irreversibility of history. This idea was interesting in a theoretical sense, as substantiated by George Dumasil, with his anti-euhemerism and Gilbert Durand. I have written previously about sociology and the morphology of time in my books Post-Philosophy, Sociology of the Imagination, and Sociology of Russian Society. Time is a social phenomenon, its structures do not depend upon their objectives, but upon the domination of social paradigms because the object is assigned by society itself. In modern society, time is seen as irreversible, progressive, and unidirectional. But this is not necessarily true inside societies that do not accept modernity. In some societies, which lack a strict, modern conception of time, cyclic, and even regressive conceptions of time exist. Therefore, political history is considered in the context of the topography of plural conceptions of time for the fourth political theory. There are as many conceptions of time as there are societies. The fourth political theory does not just discard progress and modernization, however. This theory contemplates progress and modernization relative to and intimately connected with current historical, social, and political semantic occasions, as in occasionalist theory. Progress and modernization are real, but relative, not absolute. What is meant are specified stages, but not the absolute trend of history. This is why the fourth political theory suggests an alternative version of political history based on systematized occasionalism. Carl Schmitt was very close to this in his work. Fernand Braudel and the Ecalda Annals have also been inspired by this in their writing. In the discussion of the political transformation of society, we place them in their specific semantic context, history, religion, philosophy, economics, and culture, 
with its ethnic and ethnic sociological specifics considered. This demands a new classification of social and political transformation. We acknowledge these transformations, but we do not place them onto a broad-based scale that could be the common destiny for all societies. This gives us political pluralism. The fourth political theory uses a societally dependent conception of reversible time. In the context of modernity, turning back from some point in history to a previous one is impossible. But it is possible in the context of fourth political theory. Berdyayev's idea of the new Middle Ages is quite applicable. Societies can be variously built and transformed. The experience of the 1990s is quite demonstrative of this. People in the Soviet Union were sure that socialism would proceed from capitalism, not vice versa. But in the 1990s they saw the opposite, capitalism following socialism. It is quite possible that Russia could yet see feudalism or even a slave-owning society, or perhaps a communist or primordial society emerge after that. Those who laugh at this are the captives of the modern and its hypnosis. Having acknowledged the reversibility of political and historical time, we have arrived at a new pluralist point of view for political science, and we have reached the advanced perspective necessary for ideological construction. The fourth political theory constructs and reconstructs society behind modern axioms. That is why the elements of the different political forms can be used in the fourth political theory without any connection to the time scale. There are no stages and epochs, but only preconcepts and concepts. In this context, theological constructions, antiquity, caste, and other aspects of traditional society are only some of the possible variants, along with socialism, Keynesian theory, free markets, parliamentary democracy, or nationalism. They are simply forms, but they would not be related to an implied topography of objective historical time. There is no such thing. If time is historical, it is cannot objective. Dacian says the same. Dacian is the subject of the fourth political theory. Dacian can be recovered by the refinement of the existential truth derived from the ontological superstructure of society. Dacian is something that institutionalizes time. Durand institutionalizes time by triectum in his topography. Triectum slash Dacian is not a function of time, but time is a function of triectum slash Dacian. This is why time is something that is institutionalized by politics in the context of the fourth political theory. Time is a political category. Political time is a preconcept of a political form. The fourth political theory has opened a unique perspective, if we comprehend the principle of the reversibility of time, we are not only able to compose the project of a future society, but we will also be able to compose a whole range of projects of different future societies thus we would be able to suggest some nonlinear strategies for a new institutionalization of the world. The fourth political theory is not an invitation to a return to traditional society, i.e., it is not conservatism in the conventional sense. There are many characteristics of our chronological past which are pleasant and many which are not. Similarly, the forms of traditional society can also be distinguished from each other. Finally, the ethnic and sociological matrices and the contexts of different contemporary societies are also different from each other. Therefore, the fourth political theory should not impose anything on anyone. Adherents of the fourth political theory should act step by step if we simply argue the reversibility of time and Dacian as the subjects of our theory, that would be the first and primary step. We would thus free ourselves to develop the preconcepts. We can define several preconcepts with regards to the reversibility of time and Dacian slash triectum, and therefore we can define several political concepts of time and each of them can be plugged into the current political project according to the principles of the fourth political theory. 5. Global Transition and Its Enemies The World Order Questioned The New World Order, NWO, as a concept was popularized at a concrete historical moment namely, 
when the Cold War ended in the late 1980s and genuine global cooperation between the United States and Soviet Union was considered not only possible, but very probable. The basis of the NWO was presumably a product of convergence theory, predicting the synthesis of the Soviet socialist and Western capitalist political forms and close cooperation of the Soviet Union and USA in the case of regional issues for example, in the first Gulf War at the beginning of 1991. However, as the Soviet Union collapsed soon after this, the project of a NWO was naturally set aside and forgotten. After 1991, the New World Order was considered to be something under formation before our very eyes a unipolar world led by the open global hegemony of the USA. It is well described in Fukuyama's utopian work, The End of History and The Last Man. This world order ignored all other poles of power except the USA and its allies, including Western Europe and Japan. It was conceived as a universalization of free market economics, political democracy, and the ideology of human rights, all of which were assumed to be part of a global system that would be accepted by all countries in the world. Skeptics, however, thought that this was rather illusionary and that the differences between countries and peoples would reappear in other forms, for example, in Samuel Huntington's infamous Clash of Civilizations thesis or in ethnic or religious conflicts. Some experts, in particular John Mearsheimer, regarded unipolarity not as a proper world order but, rather, as unipolar momentum. In any case, what is questioned in all these projects is the existing order of nation-states and national sovereignty. The Westphalian system no longer corresponds to the current global balance of powers. New actors of transnational and subnational scale are affirming their growing importance, and it is evident that the world is in need of a new paradigm in international relations. Therefore, the contemporary world as we have it today cannot be regarded as a properly realized NWO. There is no definitive world order of any kind. What we have instead is the transition from the world order we knew in the 20th century to some other paradigm whose features are yet to be fully defined. Will the future really be global? Or will regionalist tendencies dominate? Will there be one unique world order? Or will there instead be various local or regional orders? Or, perhaps, will we have to deal with global chaos? It is not yet clear. The transition is not accomplished. We are living in the middle of it. If the global elite, and first of all the American political and economic elite, has a clear vision of the future, which is rather doubtful, circumstances may and can prevent its realization in practice. If, however, the global elite lack a consensual project, the issue becomes much more complicated. So only the fact of transition to some new paradigm is certain. The paradigm as such is, to the contrary, quite uncertain. World order from the American point of view. The position of the United States during this shift is absolutely assured, but its long-term future is under question. The U.S. is now undergoing a test of its global imperial rule and has to deal with many challenges, some of them quite new and original. This could proceed in three different ways. 1. Creation of an American empire stricto sensu, with a consolidated and technically and socially developed central area, or imperial core, with the periphery kept divided and fragmented in a state of permanent unrest, bordering chaos. The neoconservatives, it would seem, are in favor of such a pattern. 2. Creation of a multilateral unipolarity where the USA would cooperate with other friendly powers, Canada, Europe, Australia, Japan, Israel, Arab allies, and possibly other countries, in solving regional problems and putting pressure on rogue states, such as Iran, Venezuela, Belarus, or North Korea or preventing other powers from achieving regional independence and hegemony China, Russia, etc. It would seem that the Democrats and President Obama are inclined to this vision. 3. Promotion of accelerated globalization with the creation of a world government and swift disovereignization of nation-states in favor of the creation of a United States of the world ruled by the global elite on legal terms, for example, the CFR project represented by the strategy of George Soros and his foundations. 
The color revolutions are viewed here as the most effective weapon of destabilizing and finally destroying states. The U.S. often seems to be simultaneously promoting all three strategies at the same time, as part of a multi-vector foreign policy. These three strategic directions of the USA create the global context in international relations, the USA being the key actor on a global scale. Beyond the evident differences between these three images of the future, they have some essential points in common. In any case, the USA is interested in affirming its strategic, economic and political domination, in strengthening its control of other global actors and in weakening them, in the gradual or accelerated desovereignization of what are now more or less independent states, and in the promotion of supposedly universal values reflecting the values of the Western world, i.e. liberal democracy, parliamentarianism, free markets, human rights, and so on. Therefore we face a contemporary world in a strong and seemingly permanent geopolitical arrangement where the U.S. is the core, and where the rays or spokes of its influence, strategic, economic, political, technological, informational and so on, permeate all the rest of the world depending on the strength of the societal will of the various countries, as well as ethnic and religious groups, to accept or reject it. It is a kind of imperial network operating on a planetary scale. This US-centric global geopolitical arrangement can be described on several different levels. Historically, the USA considers itself to be the logical conclusion and peak of Western civilization. At one time, this was presented in terms of the manifest destiny of America, and then in terms of the Monroe Doctrine. Now they speak in terms of enforcement of universal human rights norms, promotion of democracy, technology, free market institutions, and so on. But in essence, we are simply dealing with an updated version and continuation of a Western universalism that has been passed down from the Roman Empire, medieval Christianity, modernity in terms of the Enlightenment and colonization, up to the present-day phenomena of postmodernism and ultra-individualism. History is considered to be a univocal and monotone process of technological and social progress, the path of the growing liberation of individuals from all kinds of collective identities. Tradition and conservatism are thus regarded as obstacles to freedom and should be rejected. The USA is in the vanguard of this historical progress and has the right, obligation, and historical mission to move history further and further along this path. The historical existence of the US coincides with the course of human history. So, American means universal. The other cultures either have an American future or no future at all. Politically, there are very important trends in global politics that define the transition. The peak of the political thought of modernity was the victory of liberalism over the alternative political doctrines of modernity, fascism and socialism. Liberalism has gone global and become the only possible political system. It is now progressing further towards a postmodern and post-individual concept of politics, generally described as post-humanism. The USA again plays the key role in it. The form of politics promoted globally by the USA is liberal democracy. The US supports the globalization of liberalism, thus preparing the next step to political postmodernity as described in Empire, the famous book by Hart and Negri. There remains some distance between liberal ultra-individualism and properly postmodern posthumanism, promoting cybernetics, genetic modification, cloning and chimeras. But the world's periphery still faces the universalizing process the accelerated destruction of all holistic social entities and the fragmentation and atomization of society, including via technology, the internet, mobile phones, social networks where the principal actor is strictly the individual, divorced from any organic and collective social context. An important testimony to the dual use of the promotion of democracy has been explicitly described in an article by the American military and political expert, Stephen R. Mann, who affirmed that democracy can work as a self-generating virus, strengthening existing and historically ripe democratic societies but destroying and causing traditional societies that are not prepared for it to descend into chaos. So democracy is thought to be an effective weapon to create chaos 
and to govern the dissipating world cultures from the core, emulating and installing the democratic codex everywhere. Evidence of this process can be seen in the chaotic aftermath of the heady events of the so-called Arab Spring. After accomplishing the full fragmentation of these societies into individualization and atomization, the second phase will begin, the inevitable division and dissolution of the individual human itself via technology and genetic tinkering to create a post-humanity. This post-politics can be seen as the last horizon of political futurism. Ideologically, there is a tendency for the U.S. to increasingly link ideology and politics in their relations with the periphery. In earlier times, American foreign policy acted on the basis of pure pragmatic realism. If the regimes were pro-American, they were tolerated without regard for their ideological principles. The long-standing U.S.-Saudi Arabian alliance represents the perfect example of this realist foreign policy in practice. Thus, some features of this schizophrenic and dual morality were ideologically accepted. However, it seems that recently the U.S. has begun to try to deepen its promotion of democracy, supporting popular revolts in Egypt and Tunisia despite the fact that their leaders were trusted allies of the U.S. as well as corrupt dictators. The double standards in the U.S.'s political ideology are slowly vanishing, and the deepening of the promotion of democracy progresses. The climax will be reached in the case of probable unrest in Saudi Arabia. When this happens, this ideological pro-democracy stance will be tested in politically difficult and inconvenient circumstances. Economically, the U.S. economy is challenged by Chinese growth, energy security and scarcity, crippling debt and budget deficits, and the critical divergence and disproportion between the financial sector and the zone of real industry. The overgrowth, or bubble, of the American financial institutions and the delocalization of industry have created a discontinuity between the sphere of money and the sphere of the classical capitalist balance of industrial supply and consumer demands. This was the main cause of the financial crisis of 2008. The Chinese political economy is trying to re-establish its independence from U.S. global hegemony and may become the main factor of economic competition. The control that Russia, Iran, Venezuela, and some other relatively independent countries have over large reservoirs of the world's remaining natural resources puts a limit on American economic influence. The economy of the EU and Japanese economic potential represent two possible poles of economic competition to the U.S. inside the economic and strategic framework of the West. The USA attempts to solve these problems using not only purely economic instruments, but also political and, at times, military power as well. We could thus interpret the invasion and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as the interventions both overt and covert in Libya, Iran and Syria from a geo-economic and geopolitical perspective. Promotion of domestic political opposition and insurgents in Russia, Iran and China are another, similar method towards the same goal. But these are only technical solutions. The main challenge is how to organize the postmodern and finance-centric economy around continuing growth, overcoming the widening critical gap between the real economy and the financial sector, whose logic and self-interest become more and more autonomous. It has been asserted that the USA is the main and asymmetric actor in the center of the present transition state of world affairs. As Vedrine has noted, this actor is a true hyperpower, and the present geopolitical arrangement that includes all the levels and networks examined above is structured around this American core. The question then raised is, is this actor fully conscious of what it does and does it fully understand what it will obtain at the end, that is, which form of international system or world order is it going to establish? Opinions on this important point are divided. The neocons proclaiming the new American century are optimistic as to the future American empire, but in their case it is obvious that they have a clear, if not necessarily realistic, vision of an American-dominated future. In this case, the world order will be an American imperial order based on unipolar geopolitics. At least theoretically, it has one redeeming point, it is clear and honest about its goals and intentions. 
The multilateralists are more cautious and insist on the necessity of inviting the other regional powers to share the burden of global hegemony with the USA. It is obvious that only societies similar to the USA can be partners, so the success of the promotion of democracy becomes an essential feature. The multilateralists act not only in the name of the USA, but also in the name of the West, whose values are, or must be made, universal. Their vision of a future world order dictated by global democracy, but led by the US, is foggier and not as clearly defined as the neocons' American empire. Even hazier is the extreme vision of global governance envisaged by promoters of accelerated globalization. It might be possible to effectively overthrow the existing order of sovereign nation-states, but in many cases, this will only open the door to more archaic, local, religious or ethnic forces and conflicts. The vision of a single open and, by necessity, largely homogeneous society encompassing the earth is so fantastic and utopian that it is much easier to imagine the total chaos of Hobbes' war of all against all in the state of nature of a world without states. The visions of possible future world orders from the perspective of the US and the West differs among competing factions of American elites, ideologists, and decision-makers. The most consequent and well-defined strategy, the neocons' unipolar world order, is at the same time more ethnocentric, openly imperialistic and hegemonic. The other two versions are much more dimly conceived and uncertain. Thus, it is as likely they could lead to an increase in global disorder as order. Richard Haas has termed the paradigms of an international system according to these two visions as being characterized by nonpolarity. So the transition in question is, in any case, American-centric by its nature, and the global geopolitical arrangement is structured so that the main global processes would be moderated, orientated, directed, and sometimes controlled by the unique hyperpower actor performing its work alone or with the help of its Western allies and regional client states. The World Order from the Non-American Point of View The Americanocentric world perspective described above, despite being the most important and central global tendency, is not the only one possible. There can be and there are alternative visions of world political architecture that can be taken into consideration. There are secondary and tertiary actors that are inevitable losers in the case of the success of the American strategies, the countries, states, peoples, and cultures that would lose everything, even their own identity, and gain nothing if the USA realized its global aspirations. They are both multiple and heterogeneous and can be grouped into several different categories. The first category is composed by the more or less successful nation-states, that are not happy to lose their independence to a supranational exterior authority not in the form of open American hegemony, nor in the Western-centric forms of world government or governance, nor in the chaotic dissolution of a failed international system. There are many such countries foremost among them are China, Russia, Iran, and India, but it also includes many South American and Islamic states. They do not like the transition at all, suspecting, with good reason, the inevitable loss of their sovereignty. So, they are inclined to resist the main trends of the global American-centric geopolitical arrangement or adapt to it in such a manner that it would be possible to avoid the logical consequences of its success, be it via an imperialist or globalist strategy. The will to preservation of sovereignty represents the natural contradiction and point of resistance in the face of American-slash-Western hegemonic or globalist trends. Generally speaking, these states lack an alternative vision of the future international system or world order, and certainly do not have a unified or common vision. What they all want and share in common is a desire to preserve the international status quo as enshrined in the UN Charter, and thus their own sovereignty and identity as nation-states in their present form, adjusting and modernizing them as an internal and sovereign process as necessary. Among this group of nation-states seeking to preserve their sovereignty in the face of US-slash-Western hegemonic or globalist strategies are 1. Those states who try to adapt their societies to Western standards and to keep friendly relations with the West and the USA but to avoid direct and total disovereignization, 
this includes India, Turkey, Brazil, and up to a certain point Russia and Kazakhstan. Two, those states who are ready to cooperate with the USA, but under the condition of non-interference in their domestic affairs, such as Saudi Arabia and Pakistan. Three, those states who, while cooperating with the USA, strictly observe the uniqueness of their society by filtering those elements of Western culture that are compatible with their domestic culture from those which are not, and, at the same time, trying to use the dividends received by this cooperation to strengthen their national independence, such as China, and, at times, Russia. For those states who try to oppose the USA directly, rejecting Western values, unipolarity, and US-Western hegemony, including Iran, Venezuela, and North Korea. However, all of these groups lack an alternative global strategy that could be symmetrically comparable with American visions of the future, even if taken without consensus or a clearly defined goal. All these states generally act individually on the world stage and in their own direct interests. The difference in foreign policy among them consists only in the amount of radicalism in their rejection of Americanization. Their position can be defined as reactive. This strategy of reactive opposition, varying from rejection to adaptation, is sometimes effective and sometimes not. In short, it offers no kind of alternate future vision. Instead, the future of the world order or international system is considered as eternal conservation of the status quo, i.e. modernity, nation-states, the Westphalian system of state sovereignty, and strict interpretation and preservation of the existing UN Charter and UN configuration. The second category of actors who reject the transition consists of subnational groups, movements, and organizations that oppose American dominance of the structures of the global geopolitical arrangement for ideological, religious, and or cultural reasons. These groups are quite different from one another and vary from state to state. Most of them are founded on an interpretation of religious faith that is incompatible with the secular doctrine of Americanization, Westernization, and globalization but they can also be motivated by ethnic or ideological, for example, socialist or communist, considerations or doctrines. Others may even act on regionalist grounds. The paradox is that in the process of globalization, which aims to universalize and make uniform all particularities and collective identities on the basis of a purely individual identity, such subnational actors easily become transnational the same religions and ideologies often being present in different nations and across state borders. Thus, among these non-state actors we could potentially find some alternative vision of the future world order or international system that can stand opposed to the American-slash-Western-led transition and its structures. We can roughly summarize the different ideas of some of the more important subnational-slash-transnational groups as follows. The most recognized form at present is the Islamist world vision, which aspires toward the utopia of an individual state based upon a strict interpretation of Islamic law, or else a universal caliphate which will bring the entire world under Islamic rule. This project is as much opposed to the American-led transitional architecture as it is to the existing status quo of modern nation-states. Osama bin Laden's al-Qaeda remains symbolic and archetypal of such ideas, and the attacks which brought down the towers of the World Trade Center in New York on September 11, and which are supposed to have changed the world, are proof of the importance of such networks and the seriousness with which they must be taken. Another such project can be defined as the transnational neo-socialist plan represented in the South American left and personally by Hugo Chavez. This is roughly a new version of the Marxist critique of capitalism, strengthened by nationalist emotion and, in some cases, such as the Zapatistas and Bolivia, in ethnic sentiments or green ecological critiques. Some Arab regimes, such as the Libyan Arab Jamahiriya under Gaddafi until recently, can be considered in the same vein. The vision of the future world order is here presented as global socialist revolution preceded by anti-American liberation campaigns in every country across the globe. The US-slash-Western-led transition is envisioned by this group as an incarnation of the classic imperialism criticized by Lenin. 
A third such example can be found in the Eurasianist, aka Multipolarity, Great Spaces, or Great Powers, project, proposing an alternative model of world order based on the paradigm of unique civilizations and great powers. It presupposes the creation of different transnational political, strategic, and economic entities united regionally by the community of common geographic areas and shared values, in some cases religious and in others secular and or cultural. They should consist of states integrated along regionalist lines and represent the poles of the multipolar world. The European Union is one such example, the nascent Eurasian Union proposed by Russia's Vladimir Putin and Kazakhstan's President Nazultan Nazarbayev, another. An Islamic Union, a South American slash Bolivarian Union, a Chinese Union, an Indian Union, or a Pan Pacific Union are other possibilities. The North American Great Space, covering today's NAFTA, would be regarded as just one among several other more or less equal poles, nothing more. This is not an all-inclusive list of such non-state actors or theories with alternate visions of world order. There are others, but they are of smaller scale and thus beyond the scope of this work. In the present state of world affairs, there is a serious divide between the nation-states and the sub-state or transnational actors and ideological movements operating on different levels mentioned above. The nation-states lack vision and ideology, and the alternative movements lack sufficient infrastructure and resources to put their ideas into practice. If, in some circumstance, it were possible to bridge that gap, taking into consideration the increasing demographic, economic, and strategic weight of the non-Western world, or the rest, an alternative to the American-slash-Western-led transition could obtain realistic shape and be regarded seriously as a consequential and theoretically sound alternate paradigm for world order. 6. Conservatism and Postmodernity We are in postmodernity. The process that, in fact, has a global character is the process of once victorious modernism's movement into postmodernity. There are centers, foci, loci and regions where this process proceeds logically and sequentially. These are the West, Western Europe, and especially the United States of America, where there was a historical opportunity to create in laboratory conditions the optimal society of modernity, on the basis of those principles that were developed by Western European thought, to create from a blank page without the burden of European traditions in an empty place Native Americans, as is known, were not reckoned as people. Michael Hart and Antonio Negri show in their book Empire that the American Constitution looked at African Americans from the start as second-class people, while the Native Americans were not thought of as people at all. In such a way, the specific American system was an ideal place for the realization of a maximum of freedom, but only for white people, and at the cost of a determinate exclusion of all others. In any case, the United States of America is the avant-garde of freedom and the locomotive of the transition to postmodernism. The Liberty Poll and the Freedom to Choose TV Stations We spoke of the poll that is Western European civilization, but within the spaces of thought, in philosophy, and in the geography of the human soul. The pole of a unipolar world is nothing other than the United States and Europe as a purely geopolitical organization and specifically the idea of maximal freedom. And the movement toward the realization of this freedom is the significance of human history, as Western European humanity understands it. Western European society managed to bind the rest of humanity to this conception of the significance of history. Thus, there exists the pole of a unipolar world that is, the pole of freedom, which arrived at modernity and is now moving to a new stage, to postmodernity, in which a man begins to free himself from himself, insofar as he encumbers, interferes with, and is bored of himself. He disintegrates into schizomasses, as is written in Deleuze and Tietopus. People have become contemplators upon television, having learned to change the channel better and more quickly. Many do not stop at all, they click the remote, and it no longer matters what is on a comedy or the news. The spectator of postmodernism basically understands nothing of what happens, there is just a stream of pictures, which amuse. Television viewers are drawn into microprocesses, 
they become those who have not got their fill of the spectacle, subspectators, who never watch an entire program from start to finish, but only bits and pieces of various programs. To demonstrate this, the ideal film is Rodriguez's Spy Kids 2. It is made in such a way that there is no meaning in it. But distraction from it is impossible, because as soon as our consciousness becomes bored of it, a flying pig suddenly appears, and we must continue watching to see to where it flies. And exactly in the same way, the moment the flying pig bores us, a little dragon climbs out of the hero's pocket. This production of Rodriguez's is faultless. In principle, the man who indefatigably changes channels will find approximately the same effect here. The only channel that works according to a different rhythm is that dedicated to culture, because there one can still find unhurried histories of composers, artists, scholars, theater that is, the remnants of modernity. If it were removed from the bill, then one could calmly click through the channels not expecting to find anything that goes against the rhythm in which one must live. The paradoxes of freedom. And so, postmodernity arrives. What can oppose it? And can one say no to it? This is the fundamental question. Incidentally, emerging from that same liberal thesis which contends that man is free, it follows that he is always free to say no, to say this to whomever he will. This, in fact, constitutes the dangerous moment of the philosophy of freedom which under the aegis of absolute freedom begins to remove the freedom to say no to freedom itself. The Western liberal model says, you want to oppose us? Please, you have the right, but look, you will not want to give your washing machine back, right? The washing machine is the absolute argument of the supporters of progress. After all, everyone wants a washing machine black people, native peoples, conservatives, and the orthodox. Communists, too, according to a different logic, spoke of the necessity and irreversibility of structural change. They said that socialism would come after capitalism. Socialism came, although we plainly never had capitalism. It stayed around for some time, destroyed quite a lot of people, and then disappeared. It is exactly thus with the washing machine. If one thinks about the metaphysics of the washing machine, to what extent it is coupled with the real values of a philosophical system, one will be able to come to the conclusion that, in general, human life is possible, and perhaps even has the potential to be entirely happy, without the washing machine. But for a liberal society, this is a terrifying thing, almost sacrilege. We can understand everything, but life without the washing machine. That's already a really unscientific saying, life without the washing machine is impossible. There is no such thing. Life is the washing machine. In this resides the effect of the force of the liberal argument, which takes on a totalitarian character. There is always an element of some kind of constraint in liberation this is the paradox of freedom. At the very least, there are the constraints of having to think that freedom is the highest value. Imagine that one person says, freedom is the highest value. Another responds, no, it isn't. Then the first answers, you're against freedom? I will kill for freedom. The idea is contained in liberalism that there can be no alternatives to it. And in this there is some truth. If Logos put itself onto the path of freedom, if the social Logos was pulled into the adventure of total liberation, where was the first shove in this direction? It must be sought not in Descartes, Nietzsche, or the 20th century, but back with the pre-Socratics. Heidegger saw this moment in the conception of physis and in the way it was disclosed in Plato's teaching of the idea. But what is important is something else, the movement of Logos to freedom is not accidental, but nevertheless one can say no to it. Conservatism as the repudiation of the logic of history. There is, nevertheless, the ontological possibility of saying no. And from this begins conservatism. First, what is conservatism? It is a no said to that which is around one. In the name of what? In the name of something that came earlier. In the name of that which, properly speaking, was overcome at some point during socio-political history. 
That is, conservatism is the pursuit of an ontological, philosophical, socio-political, individual, natural, religious, cultural, and scientific position that repudiates the movements of things that we are at this time encountering and which we identified and described earlier. We are speaking now of conservatism and that with which one can deny the very course of history, pushing away from the sort of social-political topography that has driven us to modernity and postmodernity. This means the new age of modernity, with its linear vectors of progress and with its postmodern contortions, which are taking us away into the labyrinths of the disintegration of individual reality and to the rhizomatic subject or post-subject. But one can include here also earlier stages, which made this tendency possible and dominant. Conservatism builds its position on an opposition to the logic of the unfolding of the historical process. The phenomenology of modernity as, in our time, of postmodernity the rod of which conservatism seeks to reject, serves as an argument in this opposition. But conservatism as a structure does not lead to an impugning of phenomena. Negatively valued phenomenology here is not more than a pretext. Conservatism constructs a topography that rejects the logic, work and direction of historical time. Conservatism can build up its opposition to historical time in different ways. It has three fundamental possibilities for relating to the conceptual trends of modernity and postmodernity. And from this begins the systematization or structuralization of conservatism. This is a systematization without any preferences whatsoever, because the discussion is of scientific and not evaluated judgments. Fundamental conservatism. Traditionalism. The first approach is so called traditionalism. Conservatism could well be traditionalism. In some models of political science, traditionalism and conservatism differ, as, for instance, in Mannheim's. But nevertheless, the aspiration to leave everything as it was in traditional societies to preserve that way of life is, undoubtedly, conservatism. A more logical traditionalism substantial, philosophical, ontological and conceptual is one that criticizes, not various aspects of modernity and postmodernity, but that rejects the fundamental vector of historical development that is, one that essentially opposes time. Traditionalism is that form of conservatism which contends the following, what is bad are not those separate fragments here and there within a larger system that call out for our repudiation. In the contemporary world, everything is bad. The idea of progress is bad, the idea of technological development is bad, Descartes' philosophy of the subject and object is bad, Newton's metaphor of the watchmaker is bad, contemporary positive science and the education and pedagogy founded upon it are bad. This episteme reasons the conservative traditionist is no good. It is a totalitarian, false, negative episteme against which one must fight. And further, if we think his thought through, I like only that which existed before the start of modernity. One could go further and subject those tendencies to criticism that in traditional society itself made possible the appearance of modernity, all the way up to the idea of linear time. Such traditionalist conservatism, after the fall of monarchs, the separation of church and state, and the taking up of the baton of modernity by all socio-political, cultural and historical nations, was thought to be non-existent. In Russia, it was exterminated by atheist militants. From a certain point of view, it is certainly so. Inasmuch as it was thought to have been completely eliminated, people almost stopped talking about it, of social groups that stood on these positions, practically none remained, and it soon enough disappeared even from some models of political science, example, Mannheim's. For that reason, we do not see it nor begin from it. And this is unjust. If we want to trace genuine conservatism and construct a completed topography of conservative positions, we must, as a first priority, study precisely such an approach. In traditionalism we have a full-blown and mostly complete complex of the conservative relationship to history, society and the world. In the 20th century, when, it would seem, 
No social platform remained at all for such a conservatism, there suddenly appears a whole galaxy of thinkers, philosophers who begin to defend this traditionalist position. What is more, they do so with radicalism, consistency, and persistence, and not with the thoughts of the 19th or 18th centuries. These are René Guénon, Julius Evola, Titus Burkhardt, Leopold Ziegler, and all those who are called traditionalists in the narrow sense of the word. It is significant that in the 19th century, when there were still monarchs and churches, and when the Pope still decided something, there was no one who held such radical opinions. Traditionalists advanced the program of fundamental conservatism when matters concerning tradition approached their nadir. In this way, fundamental conservatism was able to be formulated into a philosophical, political, and ideological model once modernism had practically conquered all positions, but not while there were definite political and social forces still actively struggling against it. A number of political scientists in the 20th century attempted to identify or to tie together the influence of fundamental conservatism with fascism. Louis Powells and Jacques Bergier, the authors of the book The Morning of the Magicians, wrote, it could be said that Hitlerism, in a sense, was Ganonism plus tanks. This, of course, is definitely not so. Fascism is sooner the philosophy of modernity, which, to a significant degree, is contaminated with elements of traditional society, though it does not protest against modernity nor against time. Moreover, both Ganon and Evola harshly criticized fascism. In their works, Ganon and Evola gave an exhaustive description of the most fundamental conservative position. They described traditional society as a supertemporal ideal, and the contemporary world of modernity and its foundational principles as a product of the fall, degeneration, degradation, the blending of castes, the decomposition of hierarchy and the shift of attention away from the spiritual to the material, from heaven to earth, from the eternal to the ephemeral, and so on. The positions of the traditionalists are distinguished by perfect orderliness and scale. Their theories can serve as a model of the conservative paradigm in its pure form. Of course, some of their evaluations and prognoses turned out to be incorrect. In particular, both anticipated the victory of the fourth caste, in other words, the proletariat, as represented by the Soviet Union, over the third caste, the capitalist camp, which proved incorrect. They opposed communism, not completely understanding how much there was in it of traditional elements. A few of their appraisals need correction. At one congress in Rome, commemorating the 20th anniversary of Evola's death, I delivered a lecture called Evola Visto de Sinistra, Evola the View from the Left, in which I suggested having a good look at Evola from leftist positions, though he considered himself to be on the right, even on the far right. Fundamental Conservatism in Our Time There is also fundamental conservatism in our society. First, the Islamic project is fundamental conservatism. If we peel it away from the negative stereotypes and look at how, theoretically, those Muslims who lead the battle against the contemporary world would have to feel and think, we will see that they stand on the same typical principles of fundamental conservatives. They must believe in the letter of every word of the Quran, ignoring any attacks from the proponents of tolerance, who censure their opinions, finding them cruel and out of date. If a fundamentalist comes across such a commentator on television, he comes to a simple conclusion, he must throw out the television together with the commentator. There is a similar kind of orientation in America too, among fundamentalist Protestant groups. And, as is not surprising, approximately the same views are held by a significant percentage of the Republican electorate in the USA. And television programs featuring these Protestant fundamentalists, who, from a Protestant point of view, criticize everything one can criticize in modernity and postmodernity, leaving no stone unturned, are watched by millions of American viewers. There are a great number of televangelists, like the late Jerry Falwell, who criticize, essentially, the contemporary world in all its fundamentals and interpret all events from the point of view of the Protestant version of Christianity. Such people are also found in both Orthodox and Catholic circles. They reject modernity structurally and entirely, 
considering the teachings and regulations of their religion to be absolutely real, while seeing modernity and its values as an expression of the rule of the Antichrist, in which there can be nothing good by definition. These tendencies are developed among the Russian old believers. There is still a paraclete union in the Urals that does not use electric lamps. Lamps are the light of Lucifer, thus, they use only torches and candles. Sometimes this reaches the point of a very deep penetration into the essence of things. One of the old believer authors maintains that, he who drinks coffee will cough himself to death, he who drinks the tea leaf will fall from God in despair. Others affirm that one ought never to eat boiled buckwheat because it is sinful. Coffee is strictly forbidden in such circles. This may sound stupid, but stupid for whom? For rational, contemporary people. Indeed, the sin of boiled buckwheat is stupid. But imagine that in the world of fundamentalist conservatives, room is found for such a figure as the sin of boiled buckwheat. Some old believer congress might be dedicated to the sin of boiled buckwheat. At this congress, they would seek to ascertain to what order of demons it belongs. After all, there were trouser councils. When a group of young old believers, sometime in the 18th century, took on the habit of wearing checkered trousers, the Thetisians gathered a council in Kimri, sometimes called the Trouser Councils, where it was discussed whether to separate from good relations those who wear checkered trousers because it seemed at that time that it was indecent for a Christian to wear checkered trousers. Part of the council voted to separate, another part voted against. And these investigations are not really all that delirious. Old believers seem outdated to us, but they are not that outdated. They are different. They operate within the range of a different topography. They deny that time is progress. For them, time is regress, and modern men are a sacrificial offering to the devil. Here we can bring in the ideas of Claude Levi Strauss. He proves that the pre rational peoples, of whom Levi Brol and the evolutionist scholars spoke, who studied primitives, do not exist, and that aboriginal society or the structure of Indian myths were as complex in their rational connections, enumerated taxonomies and juxtaposed themes and happenings, and just as dramatic as modern European forms. They are simply different. We do not here have an example of a pre-logos but of a different logos, where the system of relations, nuances, differences, diversities and constructed models work in a different system of hypotheses, but by its own complexity and the parameters of its structures, structuralism proceeds from here. It is absolutely comparable with the consciousness, thought and social models of socialization and adaptation of other nations. In fundamental conservatism, the renunciation of modernity has a perfectly rational and systematic form. If we observe from that point of view, we see that absolutely everything comes together, everything is logical and rational but arises from a different logos. It is a logos in the space of which the sin of buckwheat, the paraclete union, living by candlelight all that which calls forth a scornful smile from the modern man does not call forth a smile. This is an utterly different regime of existence. Status quo conservatism liberal conservatism. There is a second type of conservatism, which we have called status quo or liberal conservatism. It is liberal because it says yes to the main trend that is realized in modernity. But at each stage of this trend it attempts to step on the brakes, let's go slower, let's not do that now, let's postpone that. Liberal conservatives reason approximately thus, it is good that there is the free individual, but this free post-individual, that's a little too much. Or take the question of the end of history. Fukuyama at first believed that politics had disappeared and that it would eventually be entirely replaced by the global marketplace in which nations, governments, ethnicities, cultures and religions disappear. But later he decided that one would have to slow the process down and implement postmodernity more calmly, without revolutions, because in revolutions there could appear something undesirable, which could disrupt the plan of the end of history. And then Fukuyama started to write that it is necessary to temporarily strengthen national governments. This is already liberal conservatism. 
liberal conservatives do not like leftists. They also do not like right-wingers, such as Evola and Ganon, either, but these they do not notice at all. But as soon as they see leftists, they immediately square up. Liberal conservatives are distinguished by the following qualitative structural characteristics, agreement with the general trends of modernity, but disagreement with its more avant-garde manifestations, which seem excessively dangerous and unhealthy. For instance, the English philosopher, Edmund Burke, at first sympathized with the Enlightenment, but after the French Revolution, he pushed away from it and developed a liberal conservative theory with a front-end criticism of revolution and leftists. Hence the liberal conservative program, to defend freedom, rights, the independence of man, progress and equality, but by other means through evolution, not revolution, lest there be, God forbid, a release from some basement of those dormant energies which with the Jacobins issued in the terror, and then in the anti-terror, and so on. In this way, liberal conservatism principally does not protest against those tendencies which constitute the essence of modernity and even postmodernity, although liberal conservatives, before the face of postmodernity will press down more strongly on the brake pedal than before. That is, here at some point they can even shout out, halt. Seeing what postmodernity carries with itself, and having their eyes on Deleuze s rhizome, they manifestly feel themselves out of their element. Besides, they are afraid that the quickening dismantlement of modernity, which is being unwrapped into postmodernity, might liberate the premodern. They write of this frankly. For instance, the liberal Habermas, who was once a leftist, says that if we do not now preserve the hard spirit of the Enlightenment or belief in the ideals of the free subject and moral liberation, if we do not hold man on this precipice, then we will fly off not only into chaos, but we will return to the shadow of tradition and the sense of the war against it, which was, in fact, represented by modernity. That is, he fears that fundamental conservatives will come. Bin Laden is sign. The figure of Bin Laden, independent of whether he is real or whether he was thought up in Hollywood, has a fundamental philosophical significance. This is a formulated caricature of the transition within the framework of postmodernity to the premodern. It is an ominous warning that the premodern tradition, meaning a belief in those values that were gathered into a heap and taken to the junkyard at the very start of modernity, can still arise. The physiognomy of Bin Laden, his gestures, his appearance on our screens and in newspapers and magazines this is a philosophical sign. This is a sign of warning to humanity, coming from the side of liberal conservatives. The Simulacra of Che Guevara Liberal conservatives as a rule do not perform that analysis concerning the relation between liberalism and communism that we performed, and they continue to fear communism. We already said that the events of 1991 the end of the Soviet Union possess colossal philosophical and historical significance and have few analogues. There are only a few such events in history, as in 1991 liberalism proved its exclusive right to the orthodox inheritance of the paradigm of modernity. All other versions including the most important, communism proved to be deviations on the path of modernity, offshoots, leading to another goal. Communists thought that they were traveling the paths of modernity in the direction of progress, but it became clear that they were moving towards some other goal set in a different conceptual space. But a few liberals suppose even today that communists gave up their positions only temporarily and might yet return. Extrapolating false fears, contemporary anti-communism, to a larger degree, probably, than contemporary anti-fascism, gives birth to chimeras, specters, and simulacra. Communism is no longer present, as fascism has long ceased to be, in its place there remains a plaster cast imitation, a harmless Che Guevara, advertising mobile telephones or adorning the shirts of idle and comfortable petty bourgeoisie youth. In the epoch of modernity, Che Guevara was the enemy of capitalism, in the epoch of postmodernity, he advertises mobile connections on gigantic billboards. This is the style in which communism can return in the form of a simulacra. 
The meaning of this commercial gesture consists in the postmodern laughing off of the pretensions of communism to be an alternative logos within the framework of modernity. Nevertheless, liberal conservatism, as a rule, is a stranger to this irony and is not inclined to joke with either reds or browns. The reason for this is that liberal conservatism fears the relativization of logos in postmodernity, being uncertain that the enemy has been completely defeated. It dreams that the prostrate carcass still stirs, and therefore it does not recommend approaching it too closely or mocking it, seeing this as flirting with danger. The Conservative Revolution There exists yet a third kind of conservatism. From a philosophical point of view, it is the most interesting. This is a family of conservative ideologies that it is customary to call the Conservative Revolution, CR. This constellation of ideologies and political philosophies considers the problem of the correlation between conservatism and modernity dialectically. One of the theorists of the conservative revolution was Arthur Moeller van den Broek, whose book was recently translated into Russian. Other thinkers who belonged to this tendency were Martin Heidegger, the brothers Ernst and Friedrich Jünger, Karl Schmidt, Oswald Spengler, Werner Sombart, Othmar Spann, Friedrich Hielscher. Ernst Nikisch, and a whole constellation of mostly German authors, who are sometimes called the dissidents of National Socialism because the majority of them, at some stage, supported National Socialism, but soon found themselves in a state of internal emigration, or even in jail. Many of them participated in the anti-fascist underground and helped to save Jews. In particular Friedrich Hielscher, a first-rate conservative revolutionary, and a supporter of the German national renaissance, helped the famous Jewish philosopher Martin Buber hide from the Nazis. Conservatives must head the revolution. One can describe the general paradigm of the conservative revolutionary worldview in the following manner. There exists an objective process of degradation in the world. This is not simply the striving of evil forces to perpetrate their chicanery, it is the forces of freedom, the forces of the market, which lead humanity along the path of degeneration. The peak of degeneration, from the point of view of conservative revolutionaries, is modernity. So far, everything overlaps with the traditionalist position. But in contrast to it, conservative revolutionaries begin to ask themselves, why did it happen that belief in God, who created the world, in divine providence, in the sacred, in myth, transforms in a specific moment into its own opposite? Why does it slacken and why are the enemies of God victorious? A further suspicion arises, maybe that remarkable golden age, which the fundamentalist conservatives defend, carried in itself some kind of gene of future perversion? Maybe things were not all that great even in religion? Maybe those religious, sacral and sacred forms of traditional society, which we can still catch a glimpse of up until the onset of modernity, carried in themselves a certain element of decay. And then the conservative revolutionaries say to the conservative fundamentalists, you offer to return to a condition when man exhibited only the first symptoms of illness, when there first began the hacking cough. Today this man lies dying, but you speak of how good things were for him earlier. You contrast a coughing man with a dying one, but we want to dig down to discover from whence came the infection and why he started to cough. The fact that, in coughing, he does not die, but goes to work, does not convince us that he is whole and healthy. Somewhere that virus must have nested even earlier, we believe, continue the conservative revolutionaries, that in the very source, in the very deity, in the very first cause, there is drawn up the intention of organizing this eschatological drama. In such a vision, the modern acquires a paradoxical character. It is not merely today's sickness, in the repudiated present, it is a disclosure in today's world of that which yesterday's world prepared for it, so precious for traditionalists. Modernity does not become better from this, and tradition, meanwhile, loses its unequivocal positivity. One of the most important formulas of Arthur Moeller van den Broek was, Earlier conservatives attempted to stop the revolution, but we must lead it. This signifies that, having come together in solidarity, in part for pragmatic motives, with the destructive tendencies of modernity, 
one must uncover and espy that bacillus which, from the beginning, engendered the tendency to future decline that is, to modernity. Conservative revolutionaries want not only to slow time down, like the liberal conservatives, or to return to the past like traditionalists, but to pull out from the structure of the world the roots of evil, to abolish time as a destructive quality of reality and in so doing fulfilling some kind of secret, parallel, non-evident intention of the deity itself. Dacian and Gustel The Heideggerian history of philosophy is built on a similar model. Dacian, as the final and localized being of man, began the raising of the question of being that is, of itself, and its surroundings at the daybreak of philosophy. The concept of physis became one of the first conceptions expressing this kind of questioning, likening being to nature and conceptualizing it as a sequence of a sense. The second conception was the agrarian metaphor of logos, a concept formed from the verb legion that is, to harvest, and later receiving the sense of to think, to read, to speak. The pair, physis logos, according to Heidegger, describing being, embraced it in excessively narrow frameworks. These frameworks were narrowed down further in Plato's teaching about ideas. Furthermore, European thinking only aggravated alienation from being through increasing rationalism, up to the oblivion of thoughts about being altogether. At the cusp of the 19th and 20th centuries, this oblivion spilled over into nihilism. In general terms, the definitive essence of the increasing domination of technique in Heideggerian philosophy is Gustel, that is Pastov the organization of all new alienating and nihilistic models. But for Heidegger, Gustel is not an accident. It expresses by itself that which, on the other side of being, is nothing, as its internal measure. In authentic Dacian, being and nothing must be present together. But if a man accents being as the universal, koinon, that is, only as that which is, the idea of physis, he lets out of sight nothingness, which reminds him of himself, leading philosophy to nihilism through Gustel. Thus, contemporary nihilism is not simply evil, but news of being turned towards Dacian, but given in this complex way. Therefore, the task of conservative revolutionaries is not simply to overcome nothingness and the nihilism of modernity, but to untangle the tangle of the history of philosophy and to decipher the message contained in Gustel. The nihilism of modernity thus is not only evil, as for the traditionalists, but also a sign, pointing to the deep structures of being and the paradoxes lying within them. The gloomy end of the show. Conservative revolutionaries despise the actual to such a degree that they are not content to oppose it merely with the past. They say, the actual is disgusting, but one must live it through, drive it forward, pull it to its final end. The liberal postmodernist offers an endless end. Fukuyama's end of history is not simply a disappearance, after the end of history, economic transactions continue to occur, markets continue to operate, hotels, bars and nightclubs shimmer invitingly, exchanges function, dividends are paid according to their price in the paper, computer screens and televisions shine, stocks are issued. History is not, but the market and TV are. Everything is different with conservative revolutionaries. At the end of history, they count on making their appearance on the other side of Dacian, from the troubled space of that side, and to transform the postmodernist game into a non-game. The spectacle, the society of the spectacle of Guy Debord, will end with something very unpleasant for viewers and actors. In its time, according to just such a logic, there operated a group of surrealist Dadaists, Arthur Craven, Jacques Rigout, Julian Torma and Jacques Vache, who glorified suicide. But critics thought of this as empty bragging. In one moment, the group publicly did themselves in, proving that art and surrealism were, for them, a matter of such gravity that they gave their lives for it. Here we can recall Kirillov from Dostoevsky's Demons, for whom suicide became an expression of the complete freedom that opened up after the death of God. Recently in Russia there occurred events no less horrendous. For instance, Nordost. The obscene and raunchy comic actor, Sasha Tsekalo, puts on a performance at which an impressive Moscow public is present. 
Then Chechen terrorists arrive, and at first people think that this is a part of the performance. Only later, with horror, do they understand that something not right is happening on stage, and then there begins a real, nightmarish tragedy. Conservative revolutionaries present themselves in an approximately similar manner, let the buffoonery of postmodernism have its turn, let it erode definite paradigms, the ego, superego, and logos, let it join up with the rhizome, schizomasses, and splintered consciousness. Let nothing carry along in itself the substance of the world then secret doors will open and ancient, eternal, ontological archetypes will come to the surface and, in a frightful way, will put an end to the game. Left-wing conservatism, social conservatism. There is still another tendency, so-called left-wing conservatism or social conservatism. The typical representative of social conservatism is George Sorrell, see his reflections on violence. He held back his leftist views, but at a specific moment discovered that both the left and the right, monarchists and communists, fight the same enemy, the bourgeoisie. Left-wing conservatism is close to the Russian national Bolshevism of Ustrialov, who detected Russian national myths under the purely left-wing Marxist ideology. This is even more distinctly set forth in the National Socialism of Strasser and in the National Bolshevism of Nikish. Such left-wing conservatism can be brought to the family of the conservative revolution, or it can be separated into a distinct school. It is interesting that the party United Russia adopted social conservatism as its informing ideology. This orientation is now being developed by Andrei Isayev. At the other pole of united Russia is the liberal conservatism of Pligin. Eurasianism as an episteme. Eurasianism is not a political philosophy but an episteme. It concerns itself with the class of conservative ideologies and shares some characteristics with fundamental conservatism, traditionalism, and with the conservative revolution, including the social conservatism of the leftist Eurasianists. The one thing in conservatism that is not acceptable to Eurasianists is liberal conservatism. Eurasianism, recognizing the pretense of the Western logos to universality, refuses to recognize this universality as an inevitability. This is the specific character of Eurasianism. It considers Western culture as a local and temporary phenomenon and affirms a multiplicity of cultures and civilizations which coexist at different moments of a cycle. For Eurasianists, modernity is a phenomenon peculiar only to the West, while other cultures must divest these pretensions to the universality of Western civilization and build their societies on internal values. There is no single historical process, every nation has its own historical model, which moves in a different rhythm and at times in different directions. Eurasianism, in itself, is no theological plurality. The unitary episteme of modernity including science, politics, culture and anthropology is opposed by the multiplicity of epistemes, built on the foundations of each existing civilization the Eurasianist episteme for Russian civilization, the Chinese for the Chinese, the Islamic for Islam, the Indian for the Indian, and so on. And only on these foundations, cleansed of Western-mandated epistemes, must long-term socio-political, cultural and economic projects be built. We see in this a specific form of conservatism, which differs from other, similar conservative versions, with the exception of liberal conservatism, in that its alternative to modernity is not taken from the past or from unique revolutionary conservative ideologies, but from societies historically coexisting with Western civilization, but geographically and culturally different from it. In this, Eurasianism approaches, in part, the traditionalism of Ganon, who also thought that contemporiety was a Western notion, while forms of traditional society were preserved in the East. It is not accidental that among Russian authors, the first to refer to Ganon's book East and West was the Eurasianist N. N. Alexeev. Neo-Eurasianism Neo-Eurasianism, which appeared in Russia in the late 1980s, completely apprehended the fundamental points of the previous Eurasianists' episteme, but it supplemented them with attention to traditionalism, geopolitics, structuralism, the fundamental ontology of Heidegger, sociology, and anthropology, 
and likewise carried out the gigantic task of producing concord between the basic conditions of Eurasianism and the realities of the second half of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st, with an enumeration of new scientific developments and studies. Today, Eurasianist journals are circulated in Italy, France, and Turkey. Neo-Eurasianism is founded upon the philosophical analysis of the theses of modernity and postmodernity. Detachment from Western culture allows for distance, thanks to which it is possible to embrace with a glance all of modernity, and to say to all of that a fundamental no. In the 20th century, modernity and Western civilization were systematically subjected to an analogical critique by Spengler, Toynbee, and especially the structuralists in the first place, Levi Strauss, who founded Structural Anthropology. This structural anthropology is based on the principal equality between various cultures, from the primitive to the most developed, which deprives Western European culture of any kind of superiority over the most wild and primitive non-literate tribes. Here we must recall that the Eurasianists Roman Jacobson and Nikolai Trubetskoy, the founders of phonology and eminent representatives of structural linguistics, were the teachers of Levi Strauss and trained him in the practice of structural analysis, which he himself willingly acknowledges. In this way, an intellectual chain is retraced Eurasianism, structuralism, and Neo-Eurasianism. In this sense, Neo-Eurasianism becomes the restoration of a broad spectrum of ideas, insights, and intuitions, which the first Eurasianists outlined and into which entered organically the results of the scientific activity of various schools and authors, for the most part, those with a conservative orientation, that developed in parallel throughout the entire course of the 20th century. 7. Civilization as an ideological concept. The demand for a more exact definition. There is no agreement today as to the meaning of the concept civilization in intellectual and scientific circles as, by the way, is the case with other fundamental terms. This springs from the fundamental meaning of our epoch, shifting from modernity to postmodernity, which essentially affects semantic fields and linguistic forms. And inasmuch as we find ourselves in the stage of an unfinished transition, an inconceivable confusion reigns in our ideas. Someone uses customary terms in their old sense, someone feels the necessity for semantic displacement and glances into the future, which has not yet come, someone fantasizes, perhaps coming closer to the future or simply falling into individualistic, irrelevant hallucinations, someone else gets completely confused. Whatever the case might be, for the correct use of terms, especially key terms, to which, undoubtedly, the concept of civilization belongs it is necessary today to carry out, let it be elementarily, a deconstruction, tracing the meaning to its historical context, and retracing its basic semantic shifts. Civilization as a phase of the development of societies. The term civilization received wide circulation in the epoch of the rapid development of the theory of progress. This theory proceeded from two fundamental, paradigmatic axioms of modernity, the progressive and unidirectional character of human development from minus to plus, and the universality of man as a phenomenon. In this context, civilization, for L. H. Morgan, defines the stage in which humanity, in the 19th century, everyone uncritically believed as one in the evident existence of such a concept as humanity, commences after the stage of barbarity, while that, in turn, replaces with itself the stage of savagery. Marxists adopted such an interpretation of civilization easily, having written it into the theory of the evolution of economic systems. According to Morgan, Taylor and Engels, savagery characterizes tribes engaged in gathering and primitive kinds of hunting. Barbarity relates to non-literate societies, occupied with the simplest kinds of rural economy and cattle breeding, without a clear division of labor or development of socio-political institutions. Civilization signifies by itself the stage of the appearance of letters, socio-political institutions, cities, crafts, technological improvements, the division of society into classes, and the appearance of developed theological and religious systems. Civilizations were thought of as historically steady and able to be preserved, developing, 
but with their primary features remaining constant over the course of millennia, such as the Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Indian, Chinese, and Roman civilizations. Civilization and Empire However, together with the purely historical phase meaning in the concept of civilization, a territorial sense was also included, though less explicitly. Civilization offered a vast enough area of diffusion, that is, in addition to a considerable temporal dimension, a broad spatial diffusion was also presumed to characterize it. In this territorial sense, the borders of the term civilization in part coincided with the meaning of the word empire in the sense of a world power. Empire in this civilizational sense pointed not to the peculiarity of a political and administrative arrangement, but to the fact of an active and intense spread of influence, proceeding from the centers of civilization to the surrounding territory, supposedly populated by barbarians or savages. In other words, in the very concept of civilization one can already sp the character of expansion and the export of influence characteristic of empires, ancient and modern. Civilization and the Universal Type Civilization worked out a new universal type, qualitatively differing from the models of barbarian and savage societies. This type was most often built on the globalization of that ethno-tribal and or religious center that stood at the source of a given civilization. But in the course of this globalization, that is, through the equating of the concrete ethnic, socio-political and religious pattern to the universal standard, the very important process of transcending the ethnos itself occurred, transferring its natural and organic, most often unconsciously imparted, tradition into the rank of a man-made and conscious, rational system. The citizens of Rome, even in the first stages of the empire, already differed essentially from the typical residents of Latium, while a variety of Muslims, praying in Arabic, went far beyond the Bedouin tribes of Arabia and their direct ethnic descendants. In this way, at the time of the move to civilization, social anthropology qualitatively changed, man, turning to civilization, had a collective identity imprinted on a fixed body of spiritual culture, which he was obliged to assimilate to a certain degree. Civilization assumed a rational and volitional force from the side of man that, which in the 17th century, after Descartes, philosophers started to call the subject. But the necessity of such a force, and the presence of a model, abstracted and fixed in the culture, equalized itself, to a certain extent, with both the representatives of the core ethnos, of religion, lying at the foundation of civilization, and those who ended up in the zone of influence from other ethnic contexts. To adopt the foundations of civilization was qualitatively easier than to be accepted into a tribe, inasmuch as there was for this no demand to organically absorb the gigantic reservoirs of unconscious archetypes, but to perform a series of rational, logical operations. Civilization and Culture In some contexts, depending on the country or the author, in the 19th century, the concept of civilization was identified with the concept of culture. In other cases, hierarchical relations were established between them most often, culture was thought of as the spiritual filling of civilization, while civilization properly meant the formal structure of society, answering to the main points of the definition. Oswald Spengler in his famous book The Decline of the West even contrasted civilization and culture, considering the second an expression of the organic, vital spirit of man, but the first a product of the cooling off of that spirit in mechanical and purely technical boundaries. According to Spengler, civilization is a product of cultural death. However, such a sharp-witted observation, correctly interpreting some qualities of contemporary Western civilization, did not receive general acknowledgement, and most often today the terms civilization and culture are used as synonyms, although each researcher can have his own opinion on this point. Postmodernism and the Synchronistic Understanding of Civilization Even the most cursory survey of the meaning of the term civilization shows that, in using it, we are dealing with a concept saturated with the spirit of the Enlightenment, progressivism, and historicism, which was characteristic for the epoch of modernity in its uncritical stage, that is, until the fundamental reconsiderations of the 20th century. Faith in the progressive development of history, 
in the universality of the human path according to a common logic of development from savagery to civilization, was the distinguishing feature of the 19th century. But already with Nietzsche and Freud, the so-called philosophers of suspicion, this optimistic axiom started to be doubted. And over a period of the 20th century, Heidegger, the existentialists, traditionalists, structuralists, and at last postmodernists smashed it to bits. In postmodernity, criticism of historical optimism, universalism, and historicism acquired a systematic character and established the doctrinal premises for a total revision of the conceptual apparatus of Western European philosophy. This revision itself has not yet been carried out to its conclusion. But what has been done, by Levi Strauss, Barthes, Ricoeur, Foucault, de Luz, Derrida, and others, is already enough to convince one of the impossibility of using the dictionary of modernity without a thorough and rigorous deconstruction. Paul Ricoeur, summarizing the theses of the philosophers of suspicion, paints the following picture, man and man's society consist in rational conscious components, kerygma, according to Bultmann, superstructure, according to Marx, ego, to Freud, and the unconscious, properly, structures in the structuralist understanding bases, the will to power of Nietzsche, the unconscious. And although externally it seems that the path of man leads directly from the captivity of the unconscious to the kingdom of reason, and that this exactly represents progress and the content of history, in fact, under the closest scrutiny, it becomes clear that the unconscious myth proves much stronger and, as before, considerably predetermines the work of the intellect. Moreover, reason itself and conscious, logical activity is almost always nothing other than a gigantic work of repressing unconscious impulses in other words an expression of complexes, strategies of displacement, the substitution of projection, and so on. In Marx, the unconscious is played by the forces of production and industrial relations. Consequently, civilization does not merely remove savagery and barbarism, entirely overcoming them, but itself is built precisely on savage and barbaric grounds, which transfer to the sphere of the unconscious. But there is not only nowhere to escape from this, but, on the contrary, they acquire unlimited power over man, to a large extent precisely because they are thought to be overcome, and even non-existent. This explains the striking difference between the historical practices of nations and societies, full of warfare, oppression, cruelty, and wild outbursts of terror, abounding in aggravating psychological disorders and the pretensions of reason to a harmonious, peaceful and enlightened existence under the shadow of progress and development. In this respect, the modern era is not only not an exception, but also the peak of the intensification of this discrepancy between the pretensions of reason and the bloody reality of world wars, ethnic cleansing, and the historically unprecedented mass genocides of entire races and neurotic. And in terms of savagery, modernity possesses the most perfect technical means invented by civilization, right up to weapons of mass destruction. Thus, the critical tradition, structuralism, and the philosophy of postmodernity force one to move from the mainly diachronic, phased, interpretation of civilization, which was the norm for the 19th century and which, by inertia, continues to be widely in use, to the synchronic. The synchronic approach assumes that civilization comes not instead of savagery or barbarity, not after them, but together with them and continues to coexist with them. One can imagine civilization as the numerator and savagery barbarism as the denominator of a conditional fraction. Civilization affects consciousness, but the unconscious, through the unceasing work of dreams, Freud, constantly misinterprets everything in its favor. Savagery is that which explains civilization and is the key to it. It turns out that man hurried to proclaim civilization as that which already actually happened, while it remains not more than an incomplete plan, constantly suffering disruption under the onslaught of the cunning energies of the unconscious, however we might understand it, as Nietzschean will to power, or psychoanalytically. The Deconstruction of Civilization how, in practice, can one apply the structuralist approach for the deconstruction of the concept of civilization? In compliance with the general logic of this operation, 
one should subject to doubt the irreversibility and novelty of that which constitutes the basic characteristics of civilization in contrast with savagery and barbarity. The main characteristic of civilization is often thought to be an inclusive universality, that is, the theoretical openness of the civilizational code for those who would like to join it from without. Inclusive universality is, at first glance, the complete antithesis of exclusive particularity, the primary characteristic of tribal and ancestral societies of the pre-civilizational period. But the historical pretensions of civilization to universality ecumenicalism and, correspondingly, uniqueness constantly pushed against the fact that, besides the barbarian nations, beyond the borders of such a civilization, there existed other civilizations, with their own unique and different variants of universalism. In this case, a logical contradiction was placed before civilization, either one must admit that the pretension to universality proves groundless, or one must include the other civilizations in the category of barbarians. While recognizing this groundlessness, various decisions can also follow, either to try to find a syncretic model of the unification of both civilizations, at least in theory, into a general system, or to admit the correctness of the other civilization. As a rule, in confronting such a problem, civilization acts on the basis of an exclusive, not inclusive, principle, and considers the other civilization defective, that is, barbaric, heretical, or particular. In other words, we are dealing with the transfer of the previously tribal ethnocentrism to a higher level of generalization. Inclusivity and universalism, in practice, turn into a familiar exclusivity and particularism that is usually attributed to savagery. This is easy to recognize in the following, striking examples, the Greeks, considering themselves as a civilization, numbered everyone else among the barbarians. The origin of the word barbarian is the onomatopoeic pejorative, signifying him whose speech makes no sense and is a bundle of animal sounds. Many tribes have a similar relationship to members of a different tribe, not understanding their language, they think the others have no language at all, consequently, they do not consider them people. From here, incidentally, is derived the Slavic tribal name Nancy, Germans, that is Nimi, dumb, silent, mute, for those who do not know what anyone calling himself a man should know, the Russian language. Among the ancient Persians, who represented precisely a civilization with pretensions to the universality in the form of their Mazdian religion, this was expressed even more clearly. Division into Iran, people, and Tehran, demons, was drawn on the level of religion, cults, rites, and ethics. The matter came to the point of the absolutizing of endogenous relations and the normalization of incest, in order that the solar son of the Iranians, Ahura Mazda, would not be profaned by the impurities of the sons of Ngramanu. Judaism as a world religion, having pretensions to universalism and having laid the theological foundations of monotheism both for Christianity and for Islam, which were developed by a few civilizations simultaneously is, to this day, almost ethnically limited to the blood tribes by the Halakha. The tribal system is based on initiation, in the course of which the neophyte is informed about the foundations of the tribal mythology. On the civilizational level, this same function is played by religious institutions, and in comparatively later epochs, by the system of common education, made deliberately ideological. Neophytes learn the myths of modernity in other conditions and under another veneer, but their functional value remains constant, while their foundation, if one takes into account the Freudian analysis of the substitution-repression actions of reason and the ego, has not strayed far from legend and tradition. In a word, even a rough deconstruction of civilization shows that the claims to overcoming previous phases are illusions, while in practice, big and developed collectives of people united in a civilization in essence simply repeat, on a different level, the archetypes of the behavior and moral systems of savages. Hence, endless and ever bloodier wars, double standards in international politics, fits of passion in private life, and the constantly broken ethical and normative codes of moderate and rational societies. Developing Rousseau's idea of the noble savage, Rousseau, by the way, sharply criticized civilization as a phenomenon and thought of it as the source of all evil, 
one can say that the civilized man is none other than the wicked savage, a defective and perverted barbarian. The synchronic and plural understanding of civilization prevails today. With these preliminary observations, we can at last turn to that which we include today in the concept of civilization, when we develop Huntington's thesis about the clash of civilizations or raise objections to it with the ex-president of Iran Khatami, insisting upon a dialogue of civilizations. The very fact that there is hardly any consensus in the use of the term civilization evidently shows that the phased, purely historical or progressive, interpretation of that concept, prevailing in the modern epoch and generally accepted in the 19th and first half of the 20th centuries, has clearly lost its relevance today. Only the most outdated researchers, who are stuck in the uncritical modernity of Kant or Bentham, can contrast civilization and barbarity today. Although it is comfortable to use the term civilization instrumentally in a historical analysis in the description of ancient types of societies, still, it clearly lost its ideological charge as a global positive in comparison with a global negative, barbarism and savagery. Universalism, gradualness of development, the anthropological unity of human history on the philosophical level, all of this has long been put into question. By his studies in structural anthropology, based on the richest ethnographic and mythological material of the life of North and South American tribes, Levi Strauss convincingly showed that the conceptual and mythological systems of those same primitive societies, by their complexity, richness of nuance, connections and functional elaborations of differentiations, are in no way inferior to those of more civilized countries. In political discourse, there is still talk of the privileges of civilization, but even this already looks anachronistic. We confronted such a spike of uncritical ignorance when liberal reformers tried to present the history of Russia as a continuous chain of unchecked barbarity in the face of flourishing, resplendent, and established Western civilization. However, even this was not only an extrapolation of the bravado-based, propagandistic pretensions of the West itself and a result of the network of influences induction, but also a form of Russian cargo cults, the first McDonald's private banks and clips of rock bands shown on Soviet television were perceived as sacral objects. With the exception of these propagandistic symbols or the hopeless backwardness of uncritical philosophers in the framework of an even distant familiarity with contemporary philosophy, Still the concept of civilization, in discourse that does not contradict the mainstream, is interpreted without any moral charge whatsoever, but is used as a technical term, and implies not something opposed to barbarism and savagery, but to another civilization. In Huntington's famous and aforementioned article, there is not a word about barbarism, he speaks exclusively of the borders, structures, peculiarities, frictions and differences of various civilizations which are opposed to each other. And this feature is one of not only those of his positions or lines of argument stemming from Toynbee, whom Huntington clearly follows. The use of this term in the contemporary context already suggests a blatant pluralism, comparativism, and, if you like, synchronism. Here, philosophical criticism and the reconsideration of modernity, implemented in a thousand different ways in the course of the whole 20th century, are immediately impactful. And so, if we dismiss the recurrences of uncritical liberalism and the narrow-minded naivety of pro-American and pro-Western propaganda, we will see that today the term civilization in operational and active political analysis is used above all synchronically and functionally in order to designate wide and stable geographical and cultural zones, united by approximately common spiritual, moral, stylistic and psychological arrangements and historical experience. Civilization in the context of the 21st century signifies precisely this, a zone of the steady and rooted influence of a definite social-cultural style, most often, though not necessarily, coinciding with the borders of the diffusion of the world religions. And the political formation of separate segments entering into a civilization can be rather different. Civilizations, as a rule, are broader than one government and can consist of some or even many countries. Moreover, the borders of some civilizations cross countries, dividing them in parts. 
If in antiquity, civilizations most often coincided with empires and were in one way or another politically united, then today their borders correspond to invisible lines, irrelevantly superimposed onto the administrative borders of governments. Some of these governments were never a part of a single empire, for instance, Islam spread almost everywhere in the conquests of the Arabs who built the world caliphate. Others did not share a common statehood, but were united among themselves in different ways, religiously, culturally or racially. The crisis of classical models of historical analysis, classical, economic, liberal, racial. We have established that, in the use of the term civilization in the 20th century, and in the framework of criticisms of modernity, there occurred a qualitative shift to the side of synchronicity and plurality. But can one take a step further and attempt to understand why, in fact, this word usage became so topical in precisely our time? Indeed, the earlier concept of civilization was not a subject of deliberate problematization, while it was customary only for humanitarian and academic circles to think in terms of such a category. Other approaches economic, national, racial, class-based dominated in political and, closely related to it, political science discourse. Today we see that to think only in terms of economics, to speak of national governments and national interests, and more so, to put class analysis or the racial approach at the head of one's analysis, is less and less acceptable. And on the contrary, it is rare that some statement or speech of a political actor passes by without a mention of the word civilization, to say nothing of political and analytic texts, where this term is perhaps most prevalent. With Huntington, in fact, we see the attempt to make civilization the central moment of political, historical and strategic analysis. We are clearly on our way to thinking in terms of civilizations. Here we should look more attentively at that which, precisely in the main versions of political science discourse, substitutes itself for civilization. To speak seriously of races is not acceptable after the tragic history of European fascism. Class-based analysis in the mainstream became irrelevant after the fall of socialism and the breakup of the USSR. And at that moment it seemed that the sole paradigm of political science would be liberalism. Meanwhile, the impression grew that the national borders of homogenous, essentially liberal democratic governments, no longer confronting any kind of systematic alternatives laying claim to a planetary scope, after the fall of Marxism, would soon be abolished and a world leadership and a one-world government would be established with a homogenous market economy, parliamentary democracy, world parliament, a liberal system of values and a common infrastructure of information technology. In 1990, Francis Fukuyama emerged as the herald of such a wonderful new world in his policy book, The End of History, and The Last Man Fukuyama brought the development of the phased interpretation of the concept of civilization to its logical conclusion. The End of History, in his version, signified the final defeat of civilization over barbarism in all its forms, guises, and variants. Huntington argued with Fukuyama, advancing, as his main argument the fact, that the end of the opposition of the clearly defined ideologies of modernity, Marxism and liberalism, in no way signified the automatic integration of humanity into a unified liberal utopia, inasmuch as under the formal constructions of national governments and ideological camps were found deep tectonic plates, as it were continents of collective unconsciousness which, as soon became clear, were by no means overcome by. Modernization, colonization, ideologization and enlightenment and as before, predetermined the most important aspects of life including politics, economics and geopolitics in one or another segment of human society according to their belonging to a civilization. In other words, Huntington proposed to introduce the concept civilization as a fundamental ideological concept and called for the replacement not only of the class-based analysis, but also of the liberal utopia which took too earnestly and uncritically the propagandistic demagoguery of the Cold War, and thus became, in its turn, its victim. Capitalism, the market, liberalism, and democracy seem universal and commonly human only externally. Each civilization reinterprets its substance in accordance with its own unconscious templates, where religion, 
culture, language, and psychology play a massive and often decisive role. In this context, civilization acquires a central significance in the analysis of political science, stepping into first place and replacing with itself the clichés of the liberal Vulgate. The unfolding of events in the 1990s shows that Huntington proved in this argument to be closer to the truth, and Fukuyama himself is obliged in part to reconsider his views, having admitted that he evidently spoke too soon. But this very revision by Fukuyama of the thesis of the end of history demands a more thorough reconsideration. The step back of the liberal utopians, state building. The problem is that Fukuyama, analyzing the discrepancy of his predictions about the end of history through the prism of the global victory of liberalism still tried to stay in the framework of that logic from which he at first proceeded. Consequently, he needed to implement a one-time reality check and to turn aside from that in order to admit the correctness of his opponent Huntington, who in his forecast proved by all signs closer to the truth. Then Fukuyama made the following conceptual move, he proposed to defer the end of history to an indefinite date, and meanwhile to engage in the strengthening of those socio-political structures that were the nucleus of the liberal ideology in its previous stages. Fukuyama advanced a new thesis, state-building. As an intermediate stage for the transition to global government and world leadership, he recommended strengthening national governments with a liberal economy and democratic system of rule in order to more fundamentally and profoundly work the soil for the final victory of world liberalism and globalization. This is not a rejection of the perspective, this is its postponement until the indefinite future with a concrete proposition concerning the intermediate stage. Fukuyama says almost nothing about the concept of civilization, but clearly takes into account Huntington's theses in directly responding to him. The steady development of national governments, which proved cramped both in the epoch of colonization, in the epoch of national liberation movements, and in the epoch of the ideological opposition of the two camps, must now proceed in due course. It is this which will lead gradually to different societies adopting the market, democracy, and human rights, uprooting the remains of the unconscious and preparing a more fail-safe than now, soil for globalization. Thomas Barnett's The World as Network In American political science and foreign policy analysis, there also exists a new promulgation of a purely global theory, presented this time in the essays of Thomas Barnett. The meaning of this conception comes down to this, that technological development establishes a zonal division of all territories on Earth into three regions, the core, the zone of connectedness, and the zone of disconnectedness. Barnett thinks that network processes freely penetrate through borders, governments, and civilizations, and structure the strategic space of the world in their own way. The USA and European Union are the core. There are concentrated all the codes of the new technologies and the decision-making centers. The majority of other countries, doomed to a user relationship to the network, constitute the zone of connectedness, they are compelled to use ready-made technological means and to adjust to the rules that are worked out by the core. To the zone of disconnectedness belong the countries and political forces that have stood up in direct opposition to the USA, the West and globalization. For Thomas Barnett, as for Daniel Bell, technology is fate, in it is embodied the quintessence of civilization, understood purely technologically, almost as with Spengler, but with a positive sign. The American View of the World System, Three Versions In American political analysis, and we must recognize that it is precisely the Americans who set the tone in this region all three conceptions of the separation of subjects on the map of the world coexist. Globalism and civilization, in a singular sense, in the spirit of Fukuyama's earlier ideas, are reflected in Barnett's constructions. Here only the core is recognized as a subject, the rest is subject to external direction, that is, to desubjectivization and desovereignization. Fukuyama himself, critically examining his earlier, optimistic statements, takes an intermediate position, insisting that one must, for some time longer, recognize national governments as a subject, the development of which must prepare a more secure ground for the coming globalism. 
And finally, Huntington and the supporters of his approach think that civilizations are excessively grand and foundational realities, which can well lay claim to the status of being the global subjects of world politics. When the previous ideological models collapsed, national governments started to lose, in leaps and bounds, the real stuff of sovereignty under the influence of the separate, effective aspects of globalization, but globalization itself, while breaking old borders, was and is unable to actually penetrate into the depths of societies with settled traditional components. It is significant that those forces in the world which strive to slip away from globalization, westernization and American hegemony in order to preserve and strengthen anew their traditional identity hold to precisely Huntington's thesis. Only in place of the gloomy, catastrophic discourse of Huntington concerning collision and conflict they started talking about dialogue. But this almost propagandistic, moralistic nuance should not lead us into a misunderstanding concerning the most important task of those who largely accept Huntington's model. In the first place, this is the Iranian president Khatami's juxtapositioning of collision or dialogue the question is secondary and practical. Much more important is the principled agreement that precisely civilization becomes today the foundational, conceptual analytic subject of international politics. In other words, in contrast to both globalist maximalists, like Barnett, and to moderate liberal statists, the supporters of the civilizational method explicitly or implicitly take their stand on the position of a structuralist, philosophical approach to the understanding of world processes. The marking out of civilization as the foundational subject, pole and actor of contemporary world politics is the most promising ideological approach, both for those who want to objectively evaluate the real state of affairs in world politics, for those who are striving to select an adequate toolkit for political science's generalizations of the new epoch, the epoch of postmodernity, and for those who are striving to defend their own unique identity in the conditions of a progressive blending and also of the real attacks of network globalization. In other words, the appeal to civilizations allows one to organically fill the ideological vacuum that was formed after the historical crisis of all theories that had opposed liberalism, and also after the internal crisis of liberalism itself, which was unable to handle the guardianship of the contemporary world space, as the unfortunate experience of Fukuyama's utopia confirms. Civilization as a concept construed in the contemporary philosophical context proves to be the center of a new ideology. This ideology can be described as multipolarity. The scantiness of the ideological arsenal of opponents of globalism and the unipolar world. Opposition to globalism, which announces itself ever more loudly on all levels and in all corners of the planet, has not yet formed into a concrete system of views. In this is the weakness of the anti-globalist movement, it is unsystematic and deprived of ideological orderliness, patchy and chaotic elements prevail in it, most often representing an inarticulate mixture of anarchism, irrelevant leftism, ecology and even more extravagant and marginal ideas. In it, third-rate losers of Western gauchism lay claim to the leading roles. In other cases, Globalization collides with resistance from the side of national governments, which do not wish to give over part of their sovereign authority to external control. And finally, the representatives of traditional religion, as well as supporters of ethnic and religious independence, actively resist globalization and its Atlantic Western liberal democratic code, its network nature, and its value system, individualism, hedonism, laxity. We see this especially clearly in the Islamic world. These three existing levels of opposition to globalization and American hegemony are unable to lead to the development of a general strategy and distinct ideology, which would be able to unite different and disconnected forces, at times incomparable in scale and oriented in contrary ways in relation to local problems. The anti-globalist movement suffers from the disease of infantile leftism, and is blocked by the experience of a whole series of defeats suffered by the global leftist movement in the last century. National governments, as a rule, do not have enough of a scope to throw down a challenge to the highly developed technological might of the West. Besides, 
their political and especially economic elites are completely involved in transnational projects, dependent on that very West, while local, ethnic and religious movements and communities, although they can, at certain moments, prove to be an effective opposition to globalization, are too uncoordinated to count on in earnest for a change in the foundational trends of the world or even for a correction of course. The meaning of the concept civilization in opposition to globalization. In such a situation, the concept of civilization comes to help as a fundamental category for the organization of a full-blown alternative project on a world scale. If one puts this concept at the center of attention, then one can find a basis for a harmonic resonance of alignment of broad governmental, public, social and political forces into a general system. One can unite under the banner of a multiplicity of civilizations, peoples, and religious and ethnic communities living under various governments, offering them a common, centralized idea, in the framework of a concrete civilization, and leaving them many choices for the hunt for identity inside it, allowing for the coexistence of civilizations, differing according to their fundamental parameters. And such a perspective absolutely does not necessarily lead to a clash of civilizations, Huntington notwithstanding. Here both conflicts and alliances are possible. The most important thing is that a multipolar world, emerging in such an instance, will create the real preconditions for the continuation of the political history of mankind, inasmuch as it will normatively affirm a variety of socio-political, religious, moral, economic and cultural systems. Otherwise, simple and sporadic opposition to globalism on a local level or on behalf of an ideologically amorphous mass of anti-globalists, and that in the best case, will only postpone this end and will put the brakes on its onset, but will not become a real alternative. Toward large spaces The selection of civilization as the subject of world politics in the 21st century will allow one to conduct regional globalization, a unification between themselves of countries and Narodi, relating to one and the same civilization. This will allow one to make use of the benefit of social openness, not in relation to everyone simultaneously, but rather in the first place to those who belong to a common civilizational type. An example of such integration along civilizational criteria is afforded by the new supranational political organization of the European Union. It is a prototype of regional globalization, including in its boundaries those countries and cultures that have a common culture, history and value system. But having admitted the undoubted right of Europeans to form a new political subject on the basis of their own civilizational differences, it is rather natural to admit an analogical process in the Islamic, Chinese, Eurasian, Latin American, and the African civilizations. After Carl Schmitt, it is customary in political science to call analogical projects of integration large spaces. In economics, even before Schmitt, this was theoretically understood and employed in practice with colossal success by the creator of the model of the German customs union, Friedrich von List. The large space is a different name for that, which we understand by civilization in its geopolitical, spatial and cultural senses. The large space differs from other existing national governments precisely in that it is built on the foundation of a common value system and historical kinship, and it also unifies a few or even a multitude of different governments, tied together by a community of faith. In various large spaces, the integrating factor can vary, somewhere it will be religion, somewhere ethnic origin, somewhere cultural form, somewhere the socio-political type somewhere geographic position. An important precedent, the creation of a European Union shows that the embodiment of the large space in practice, the transition from a government to a supragovernmental establishment, built on the foundation of civilizational commonality, is possible, constructive and, despite all internal problems, positively unfolds in reality. A register of civilizations. In contrast to national governments, it is possible to argue about the number and borders between civilizations. Huntington separates out the following. 1. Western. 2. Confucian, Chinese. 3. Japanese. 4. Islamic. 5. Indian. 6. 
Slavic Orthodox. 7. Latin American and possibly. 8. African civilizations. However, some considerations force themselves on us. Huntington includes the USA and Canada in Western civilization with Europe. Historically this is accurate, but today, from a geopolitical point of view, they constitute in relation to one another two different large spaces, the strategic, economic and even geopolitical interests of which diverge ever more and more. Europe has two identities, the Atlantic, for which it is entirely fair to identify Europe and North America, and the continental, which, on the contrary, is strongly attracted to the construction of independent policies and to the return of Europe to history as an independent player, and not as a mere military beachhead for its North American younger brother. Euroatlantism has its headquarters in England and the countries of Eastern Europe, which are moved by an inertial Russophobia, while Eurocontinentalism has its in France and Germany, with the support of Spain and Italy. This is classic old Europe. The civilization is, in any case, one, Western, but its large spaces, it may be, will be organized somewhat differently.